Welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, a show about weirdos, with your hosts, John Fahey, Aaron Peter, and Matt Brousseau. Hello folks, welcome to Profiles in Eccentricity, it's a show about weirdos, doggone it. My name is John Boy, I'm your host, John Francis Fahey, join me as ever is felonious spunk oh come on real jizz master dude your cum stinks come on that's not cool yeah aaron joseph Peter, my co-host hi how are you i'm great how are you good now uh i'm glad you're good over here to my one o'clock we've got infamous uh plane hijacker pee pee pooper like that? You like pee pee pooper? Yeah, I like do. That. I do like yeah. that. Yeah, you're. I got a lot of pee pee poo poo on the mind. Pee pee pooper. Yeah, very good. That's handsome, Matt Brousseau. How are you, pal? I'm good. Good. You should see the artist. You look great. Rendition you ever... of pee pee pooper. Yeah, I bet. Yeah, this guy looks like shit <laughs> and piss. <laughs> yeah, no wonder. Who's they... in that suitcase? Yeah, no... <laughs> no wonder they let it out of that plane. <laughs> He's really Get him out. Yeah. I hope it wishes a Boeing door. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you guys trying to find him? <laughs> Gross. Does, does he shit in the woods? They're all number two dollar bills. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. I like that. I like that. Jefferson. Gentlemen, good to be with you. You too. Be here. Um, we have to say uh, at the beginning of this episode, uh, we are going um, to do a profile of part two mm-hmm. of Mr. Jack Kirby. Jack the King Kirby. Aided and abetted by... The Beautiful. queen. Beautiful young girl. The queen, Laura Crawford. Laura wow. Crawford. Uh, her exhaustive research made this possible. Yes. Um, I could not have done it at all. Thank you, Laura. Without you, Laura. this wonderful research. And um, we, uh, what, what did we do yesterday on the on the Patreon? We talked about some porno, I believe. Yeah, we talked about uh, comics, X-Men. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, very little porno, I think. Yeah, very little porno. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and we don't mean like little porno. We just mean yeah, no yeah. porno. Yeah. Uh, uh, movies. Yeah, films. Yeah, some other bullshit. Yeah, yeah. It's a good, it's a good time over there. Extra episode per week, five dollars a month, a real delight. You talked about P Diddy. And, we did. Uh, yeah, we talked about P Diddy extensively. Of uh, John, he's a friend of yours. You can call him Sean. I don't call him Sean no, no, Pussy no. Combs. Just Jay Z and his mother can call him that. And we don't know his whereabouts, but we are following. Uh, he's uh, like the ultimate warrior. Whereabouts unknown. Well, yeah. Uh, <laughs> parts unknown. Parts unknown. Parts unknown. Parts unknown. Parts unknown. But I'll tell you this, if you want to know what's going on with Puff Daddy, all you got to do is follow 50 Cent. <laughs> follow and, the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Follow the four bits. Buy some coin. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, really, you will get the most up-to-date information on the Puffy thing. I guarantee you, uh, if you just follow 50 Cent. And um, Aaron, I was I was thinking about part one, and uh, I was a little hazy. Mm-hmm. On the timely stuff mm-hmm. and what Kirby did there, that was his. Uh, did he create? He didn't create Human Torch. No, original. Correct. He did not create Namor. No, correct. He did not create Shazam either, or uh, what you would call Captain Marvel. Um, but he did create Captain. America. He did create Captain America. Yes. There was a similar-ish character at the time called the Shield, but they mm. made some changes to their own character to make it different. And you know. It was only similar in that it was a patriotic character. Correct. Um, who also had a shield, but warriors have had shields since time Ooh, immemorial. Yes, long time. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, rocking the Doctor Doom shirt here today. Love Doctor Doom. Dude, Doctor Doom's the best. It says you're doomed. You yeah. Mm, very nice. Courtesy of Bandit Boys. Hopefully they'll sponsor the show and give me free, give us free shit. Yeah, I, I yeah, I would like some stuff. Yeah. Um, things. Yeah. So, uh, part two of Jack the King of comics, Kirby, at the end of part one, we saw, uh, Jack Kirby and Joe Simon ending their professional friendship after some 16 years. And Kirby was, you know, workaholic. So he took all the freelance gigs that he could find. And he, so he was drawing things that weren't, you know, superhero stuff. It's like high school romance and Westerns uh-huh. and stuff like that. Right. He, he worked in his, um, uh, he worked in his basement that they called the dungeon. And he had still in the city. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, had an extensive collection of pulp comics, magazines, science fiction magazines, 
history, mythology, science. Like he surrounded himself oh. with everything that he would go on to then draw from. Yeah. You know, he kind of, excuse me, immerse himself in a soup of yes information. Mm. Yeah. And you can um, just just the the, the Joseph Campbellism of of it all. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if he. I'm I'm sure he was well versed in Campbell mythology. Yeah. Um, so he would keep the radio and the TV on while he was working through the night. Mm. Um, he didn't do any preliminary sketches or layouts. He started with a blank canvas and went for it, and just went top left. To bottom right, and like panels, and rarely used an eraser. Wow. Um, he and Roz worked as a team. He was kind of like the quintessential eccentric artist who couldn't really do anything but what he did. If there was money in his wallets, because Roz put him there, um, she would do all the family's driving because he would be driving and he'd start thinking about fucking drawings and then they end up on the sidewalk. You're kidding. <laughs> yeah. Whoa. Yeah. That's very uh, Serling as well. Yeah, he was the just... The wandering off yeah, during... Whoa. Whoa. Yeah. My imagination. We're gonna die. Huh? <laughs> Get back here. <laughs> oh, you know, every time you hit a pedestrian, you probably think of an idea. Yeah. Someone better... should save these people. <laughs> the Schwarzwald. <laughs> so... Uh, he, he was just pure artist. He wasn't the salesperson or you know spokesperson that Stan Lee was. You know, in in pitch meetings, pitch meetings with executives, he'd ramble off and then spurn off to other new ideas and all. And, and we would just kind of butterfly off into mm. rambling. Um, he was just that kind of uh, mind, right? Interesting. Um, he was in kind of uh, financially uncertain terms in the late fifties. He would have recurring nightmares about being unemployed, unable to provide for his wife and three kids, walking the street like a fucking bum. Ugh. In, uh, in the dreams, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. In addition to his nightmares about war. Yeah. Um, over at Timely slash Atlas Comics, Stan Lee was still um, editor-in-chief. Uh, remember that Stan Lee, at one point, was kind of like uh, an, uh, a subordinate to him. Yes. Uh, and, and Joe Simon. But uh, but but Stanley was still struggling. Comics did not make as much money as as the company's other divisions. People would say that Martin Goodman, the the chief executive, just kind of kept the comics division going so that Stan could have a job. Um, remember, they were, they were kind of uh, they had a fam familial connection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Every month, Stan Lee would uh, assemble about ten comic titles on a very small budget with a small staff, and it was usually like one or two westerns, two or three teens. Teen genre comics, a, a romance comic, and the rest were like monster science fiction stuff. Um, and uh, one day, this uh, an inker, Frank Giacola, went to Stan looking for work, uh, suggesting that he could get Kirby to do the penciling. So Stan agreed to that and brought Kirby back to Timely slash Atlas Comics. Um, and as much as Kirby hated going back to work for Stan Lee, uh, he swallowed his pride uh, and would Ended up relying on Stan for work. I didn't realize things, I guess, were that acrimonious that early. I, they, Yeah, I, I think they were just like, he was a prideful guy. Yeah. And, you know, they're, they're two very different guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you could say, I mean, it, it seems like uh, Stan would just be the best bullshitter, and Kirby was kind of the guy with the goods. Yeah, you know, Stan wanted to, uh, you know... Um, God, what was I watching the other day? I think it might have been even in one of the. Oh, uh, it was in the um, the proto pilot for X Men, the animated series, I believe. Stan insists uh, Pride of the X Men. Mm -hmm. Stan insisted on narrating. Really? Yeah. So you'll hear Stan's voice in the beginning, and like in some of the other cartoons. I don't know if you remember from the early '90s. Like Stan Lee would have either like interludes between. Um, Did it work? Well. The show didn't get picked up. It took years. You know, yeah. they had to retool the whole thing. Yeah. But he, you know, he he in, insisted on himself. Yeah. But he is comics great evangelist and advocate. Yeah. So like, let's yeah. not take that away. Yeah, and 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 there was a thing about uh the steady voice of a narrator. Yeah. Uh, and and that it presided over the burgeoning uh Marvel universe. Exactly. 
Uh, and it was and, the voice of God in a way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And but, for a weird thing like the X Men and animates, you know, there's an argument to be made that maybe they needed that. Yeah. And then you can have less exposition if you just have a narrator, right? Mm-hmm. And, and you know, for some of the fans, it it gives them that connection with it's oh oh, we, oh Stan Lee's involved. Yeah, it's got to yeah, be good. Yeah, he had been by the by the. I mean, he was front and center in this. Like starting in the '60s, he insisted on himself being everywhere all the time, uh-huh. um, and so he was. Fans were well acquainted with Stanley. Yeah. Um, but back to the '50s. Um, in '56, '57, Jack only drew about 20 stories for Atlas Comics. Uh, he did all the genres except for teen. I don't know what the deal with that was, but um, they had a big free. <laughs> They had a big uh, pool of freelance artists at Atlas. I Comics. don't do teams. <laughs> Not since I left the Psalm. <laughs> they got no problems. <laughs> Never again. <laughs> well, we found the Jack voice. <laughs> <laughs> he had kind of more like a, like this. Oh, you've heard him talk? Yes. <laughs> It's oh, not. He, it's not that. It's not Gilbert. It's not no, Gilbert. No. But it's going there. Yeah, it's it's little a little more like gruff that. than Stanley. Right. It's a more you know Stanley kind of had a slightly higher nasally. He's got kind of a more thing like yeah yeah, yeah. He sounds like this and you know you know Jack who, smoked cigars and uh, still had that same kind of and the the thing where the guy that talks like this is such a a uh, 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 an American uh it, it it's not a, a mid Atlantic. No. But it's a different type of mid-Atlantic, where it's a guy that sounds like this, and he's and he's you just know he's northeast. And you know who else had, had it uh, is uh, George Romero. Yeah, if, if you hear George Romero talk and Stan Lee talk, they mm-hmm. they both sound like guys that. Uh, or, like they were lived in Chicago and Buffalo, <laughs> yeah, it's weird. and then they moved to Philly, or, yeah, 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 and spent yeah. some time in New York for sure. <laughs> um. By the way, just as a side note, I watched the um, the four part series on uh, BritBox Archie about Cary Grant. Oh yeah, it's four part. Jason Isaacs stars, produces. It's kind of bad, but he is fucking excellent. Oh, really, he is like is it, talking about a guy who created himself and and had yeah, this, yeah. you know weird accent from Bristol and yeah. kind of changed it, cre- changed his name and, that, and a crazy life in his own right. But, and then was he the big acid guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He did. Uh, he was very. He did a lot of therapy, uh, LSD assisted therapy. Yeah, and yeah. was that also because I know it's tied. In, like we're going way off here. I'm sorry. It's okay. But it, it's a. Uh, it was kind of associated uh, acid at that time with the beginnings of Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. And but and that I don't think that was the, the that wasn't his his reason. his was reconciling a lot of trauma. Yes, yeah. and um, was he closeted? No, um, but they, they do allude to, you know, I. there's a line where I've loved, I've fallen in love with many people and every single one of them has broken my heart. All right. Um, he's really fucking good in it. Yeah. The rest of the show is kind of whatever. There's some great, you know, it's a period piece throughout. It's so like great cars and mm-hmm. set design. Yeah, yeah. Some of the writing and acting is clunky and some of the flashback stuff is kind of weird and stupid. But he really, honestly, like it's worth watching just to see him and his earnestness in it. Like got a little emotional. Um, one, one thing, uh, just to bring it back, uh, along the lines of television, what you're, uh, telling me about, um, the, uh, the nature of the Kirby and Stan thing reminds me because I'm almost done with Mindhunter. Mm-hmm. It reminds me of the two of them where like the guy that is like, you know, like the guy, like he, every, anytime he talks, mm. uh, he, he like ends up rambling yeah, because like, he's so up. he's yeah, so yeah. into this stuff. But the other guy knows like just tell anecdotes that people like mm-hmm. and let them know how this science is working. Yeah. Like don't don't get lost in the weeds. And yeah. it's it's a thing of like the pitch man versus the idea guy. That's yeah. like not you're like yeah just you're go. not you're not a people you're not ready for prime. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, so Atlas had a, a a pool of freelance artists. Um, quite quite a bullpen. Steve Ditko. Uh, co-creator of Spider-Man. Don Heck, uh, Iron Man, The Wasp, Black Widow, Hawkeye, Dick Ayers, Ghost Rider, and uh, Gene Colan, Daredevil, and Howard the Duck. Kirby took over as a writer and artist uh, for um, an issue of Yellow Claw. 
It was about a Chinese American FBI agent, Jimmy Woo. We know Jimmy Woo. No way. Yeah. Wow. Uh, from the WandaVision program right, and the right. Ant-Man motion pictures. Yes. Um, Fascinating we imagine. It's about FBI agents Jimmy Woo's battles with communist supervillain Yellow Claw. Um, Kirby at the same time was freelancing for DC Comics doing sci-fi stories. Um, he told his editor that he wanted to do longer form pieces with recurring characters and Schiff told him to go ahead and pitch. Can I just say real quick, he's got Jimmy Woo, FBI agent, being the guy that is fighting the Yellow Claw, who is ostensibly an Asian communist. Mm -hmm. So he still has the thing where he goes like, there's an American foil yes. that is Asian. And he's good. To the foreign yeah. scourge. There yes. are good ones, too. Just, yeah, yeah. That's what he's doing. It's the, that's why it's as, Kirby he, is the most American guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's so sweet. So he um he started pitching this story uh, called Challengers of the Unknown. Um, they are four men uh, who are traveling to appear on a radio program. Uh, Lester, Rocky Davis, a strong but slow-witted Olympic wrestler. Mm. Walter, Professor Haley, a scientist and master sin diver. Matthew, Red Ryan, a circus daredevil. And Kyle, Ace Morgan, a combat veteran jet pilot. They're caught in a storm and their plane crashes. But they miraculously all four survive. They agree with they must make the most of their borrowed time left. They'll work as a, together as a team, challenging the unknown. And their uniforms have an hourglass logo sh to show time running out. That's dope. Yeah. They use a hollowed out mountain for their headquarters. The team becomes famous and they accept unknown challenges, un, uh, people, problems, mad scientists, the Pentagon, all contract them out to solve problems. I like they were taking a plane to a radio interview. Well, they gotta go somewhere. Serious, serious they didn't have fucking Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, you know, they would explore, explore paranormal occurrences and encounter many fantastic menaces. Hmm. Um, Challenges debuted in a bi-monthly series in 57, made a few more appearances through 58, and moved to its own title uh, with issue one in 1958. Um, and Kirby would say, I began to think about three words which have always puzzled me. What's out there? The team encounter genies, aliens, robots. They tackle mysteries like the Bermuda Triangle, travel through space and time, other dimensions. Uh, he was at DC for about 30 months and only did about t penciling about 20 pages a month. Uh, now that's a lot. Mm -hmm. But for him, it wasn't. Um, the editor Schiff put him on Green Arrow and he drew 11 six-page Green Arrow stories and inked them himself. He moved Green Arrow away from his Batman-like roots. If you don't know Green Arrow, Green Arrow is Oliver Queen, rich guy, gets mm -hmm. fucking lost on an island, becomes a fuck, like Hawkeye Batman type of guy. Yeah, cool. Okay. Um, and he, he made him more of a sci-fi hero. Um, the character's co-creator and DC editor did not like that. Um, in May of 57, Atlas Comics had the Atlas Implosion, implosion, which was the cancellation of multiple series and work stoppages due to major distribution problems. Um, uh, in the wake of that, he revived the Black Rider, uh, a costume Western hero from the 40s. Um, and then one day, Joe Simon calls him up. And he's, so. like, he's like, let's make, let's make sci-fi stories for Harvey Comics together. And at that, uh, since, since their breakup, uh, Simon had turned a Mad Magazine knockoff, sick, <laughs> into a modest success. I remember that. Yeah? Yeah. I had no idea. Yeah. Um, God, Mad Magazine. Was it like an exclamation? Uh, yeah. I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, their issue of Alarming Tales number one came out in September 57. Um, his work in the anthology Amazing Tales... Uh, uh, had the last enemy where a man traveling far into the future learns that humans wipe themselves out and the animals who took over uh, in their place were at war. Mm -hmm. um, he would try to get other comic strips syndicated in newspapers because still there were still comic strips in the newspapers. Sure, yeah, One yeah. was Commandy of the Caves. The other was Space Busters. Um, he would try... Uh, to make other sci-fi comics work, but they didn't always. What the hell is that flying around? That's a fly, Aaron. Hmm. It could be a man. Nah, I thought, what if, what if there was someone that had the powers of a Think fly? Think about like yo, uh, flying on the a fly on the wall. One of them uh, flies. It's a man. Fly guy or something. Uh, um, he just bothers you. <laughs> 
so the editor wanted to capitalize um, on the interest of the space race happening at the time. Um, Schiff. Uh, so he went to Kirby. Kirby pitched something called Space Busters, but rejected that concept. Um, space Busters, like Busters in space. Uh huh. Like my like. And I think it makes them feel good. <laughs> I, I would imagine. So. Yeah. I would certainly imagine so. <laughs> They were, yeah, you can't say dropping loads in space, though. No, because they float. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, they don't drop. Yeah. <laughs> in space, nobody can feel you drop. Oh, God. Yeah. But they can smell it. Yeah. Yours. <laughs> Shut the fuck up. Um, he'd work on uh, a new strip. Most felonious <laughs> motherfucker. He would work on a, another um, concept called uh, Sky Masters of the Space Force. <laughs> Oh. Bit of a mouthful. Yeah. yeah. But we have Space Force today, so. Sky Masters of the Space Force. <laughs> um, they and they, there, there were some contract negotiations about guaranteeing a percentage of the profits and um, some boring bullshit. Um, needless to say, Kirby got screwed. Um, in 58, the first Sky Master strip debuted in over 300 newspapers nationwide. Um but Kirby and Schiff's relationship was strained um, uh, because they were also working with these guys, uh, Dave and Dick. Good guys. Wood. Dave and Dick Wood. The Wood Brothers. Yeah, and his wife said, the reason the strip didn't last is because the Wood Brothers kept disappearing. She called them eccentrics. Kirby had to send postcards to get a hold of them. (laughs) They had more luck communicating with their mother. Uh, Roz would also say that uh, one of them got in trouble with the law. So Kirby ended up just doing the bulk of the work. Of Sky Master. Dave is sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> and Dick, I don't know where he is. <laughs> you tell me. Do you know where Dick is? Thank you for your postcard, Mr. <laughs> Kirby. <laughs> your little doodles are fantastic. <laughs> we have a house phone. <laughs> um, so, like I said, Kirby would end up writing most of Sky Masters. Uh, he speculated about what real-world space travel would be like, and referenced Popular Mechanics or Pulp Magazine for details. Like I said, he had this; he was just he was surrounding himself with, yeah. with um, you know, a rich tapestry. Yeah, you need ideas, you need inspiration. Yeah. One time, a pair of FBI agents visited Kirby, asking him how he heard about the technology depicted in Sky Masters, and he told him he just made it up. Mm. So they walloped him. <laughs> yeah, yeah like, who, who's this Jimmy Woo character? <laughs> How'd you know about Woo? <laughs> woo? <laughs> woo peed on my rug. <laughs> um, Let's talk about some guy that built the railroads here. Uh, there was some more contra- <laughs> There was a bunch of like you know more uh, contract bullshit, not getting paid. Um, uh, you know uh, them. TC nit, nit, nitpicking Kirby for stupid details like not drawing boo laces or <laughs> showing a Native American mounting his horse from the wrong side. Um, well, like backwards? Yeah, dude, I don't fucking know. <laughs> so they fired him from Challengers and DC stopped offering him work. Um, and, uh, but Interesting things to, to pick on, yeah. They were just looking for reasons. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, makes yeah, sense, yeah. And not pay him what he was owed. Right. Uh, but, uh, he got a call from old Stan Lee, and the free Jack. I got a job. Stan Lee here. Uh, the uh, implosion over a timely Atlas was over, and he had some work for him. Uh, then he, uh, um, Schiff over at DC sued him, sued Kirby for breach of contract. Um, with some questionable legal advice, Kirby thought he could convince a judge that he'd only signed the contract out of fear for of losing work at DC. Um, he just was so scatterbrained on the stand and everything. His, Roz said that under oath he couldn't get his own name right. <laughs> he lost the suit. He had to pay Schiff some money, uh, and then keep paying him on commission as they kept running Sky Masters, mm-hmm. which wasn't taking that much money anyways. But but the real winner of the Schiff versus Kirby lawsuit would be Marvel Comics, uh, because Kirby would go to Marvel in '59. And um, he'd be doing stuff with Stan Lee. They'd do monster stories, uh, and, and the covers would read Stan Lee and Jack Kirby. And Kirby 
It denies it, Stan. Whatever really did anything. <laughs> sure, sure. But a promotion uh, is something. Kirby said, you know, he'd draw everything and then he'd write the story on the back of the pages for Stan to write the the um, dialogue, dialogue and description. And, I, and I, I think wasn't there a thing? I don't know if you mentioned, before, but like he would draw it in a way like well, that's it's the story. explicit. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing about Kirby would draw in such a way that like an illiterate can understand what's going on. <laughs> yeah, so like, yeah. you know, the, the, the dialogue, uh, or the description was a formality. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but even then, like Stan Lee would either hand it off to somebody else or, or write his own. And the thing to remember there too, is that like, it was still clunky at the time. Oh, the dialogue, the dialogue, was yes. fucking dialogue. Atrocious. Yeah, Atrocious. Uh, uh, you know, when it was in the firm border or the thought bubble or the speech bubble, Whatever it was, you know, in the firm border at the top, you know, it's the narrative. Yeah. And that's basically a voice of, of Stan. Mm -hmm. And it would still be... So bad. So bad. A lot of camp. You know? Yeah. It'd be crazy to see, like, really those comics just with all of that absent. And just be, the, like... Be better. Just be the images. <laughs> the silent yeah. movie, yeah. Uh... Um... So, um... In 59, uh, he worked on sci-fi anthologies like Tales to Astonish and Western titles like The Two-Gun Kid. He wrote under a five-page story for Cracked, um, but mostly kept doing more Westerns. Cracked around. was around. Yeah. Didn't know that. Not Did not around. know that. Um, he had their fourth uh, child, Lisa, in September of 59. He introduced Groot in the November issue of Tales to Astonish number 13. Well, Stan yeah. definitely wrote the, the words for that one. Yeah. <laughs> I am grew it. Genius. <laughs> <laughs> Just like I drew it. Um he would work um uh more monster stories. Uh Gugam, son of Goom, of course. Uh but of course uh very famous Fing Fang Foom. Yes. Mm. The giant dragon. Um now there's a legend that Martin Goodman was uh golfing with an editor from DC, um and the DC guy was was uh, bragging about the Justice League of America sales, and that Goodman told Stan Lee to make a superhero team, and Stan came back with a Fantastic Four. It never happened. Oh, really? Yeah. But uh, that's a popular rumor. Yeah, I mean, I had never heard it, but it sounds like something Stan would say. Yeah. Um, because you know, Stan would say, "I'd like to do this type of story. I myself would enjoy reading, and the characters would be the kind of characters I could personally relate to." Mm -hmm. um, and that—that that is, to Stan's credit, that is what was so great about Marvel was making relatable characters. Mm -hmm. Very true. Uh, doing the world, you know, Marvel is the world outside your window. You know? Yeah, yeah, and and it was, you know, uh, pleasantly preachy. Uh, that's the thing we got we got to say about Stan too. Is that like th for what for the for the time they were incredibly very progressive, progressive and also reminding you that uh, these were all very American ideals, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and and uh, you know just an American is a broad definition. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 you know just I mean you know a very simple golden rule type thing of like you know put yourself in somebody else's shoes mm -hmm. and that sort of stuff, and and that helped r the brand immeasurably. But also, yeah, they would go to some some darker places and uh, and show some you mm -hmm. know more challenging stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Kirby would say that um, the Fantastic Four idea came from him, which is is much more likely. When people can't, when people began talking about the bomb and its possible effect on human beings, they began talking about mutations. And I said, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. That's how the Fantastic Four began to them in his head with an atomic explosion and its effect on the characters. And also you said that previous team that... Yeah, he very heard. clearly. Yeah, yeah, very clearly. Yeah. That was the proto-Fantastic yeah. Four. And I will say also, I believe at this time, uh, Rob Liefeld, in the innumerable podcasts I've listened to about him, he just said, in general at that time, the data was showing teams are hot. Yeah. So Marvel was coming... We up, got, you know and, what I mean? And what if we make it a family? So, um, he went into the Marvel offices and they were moving out furniture because things were not good. And he was like, I got a family and a house and Marvel is falling apart. Stanley's sitting on a chair crying. I told him to stop fucking crying. <laughs> Go into Martin Goodman and tell him to stop moving the furniture and I'll sell the books that make the money. I came up with a Fantastic Four. I came up with Thor. Whatever it took to sell a book, I came up with. 
I had to do something different. The monster stories had their limitations, so I felt the idea was to come up with new stuff all the time. I revived what I could, and I came up with what I could. Stan Lee was an editor. He worked 9 to 5 doing business for Martin Goodman. Um, So, you know, Stan would say, yeah, after kicking it around with Goodman and and Kirby for a while, we decided to call them the Fantastic Four. I wrote a first synopsis for Jack to follow, and the rest is history. Um, And that system became known as the Marvel Method and became standard practice. Um, But Kirby would go on to say, like, you know, it was my idea to do it the way it was. I'm not saying Stan didn't have anything to do with it. Of course he did. We talked things out. But, you know, it, it's hard not to see the similarities between Ben Grimm and Jack Kirby. Of course. Yeah, yeah. Growing up in a gang as a kid, being a kind of brute dude, getting into fights a lot. Uh, and then you see, you know, the, the challengers of the unknown, mm-hmm. basically like the proto-Fantastic Four, becoming famous, famous, solving mysteries, the other dimension. Like, come on. Yeah. And still being freaks. And then having having this thing, I, I I gotta say this real quick too. I'm I'm sorry. Though. And let me just say that his daughter's name is Susan. Really? <laughs> yeah. Susan Storm. Right. I um, but like so in the EC comics, like the science fiction stuff, hitherto before, <laughs> um, there was always a thing where it was like humans go, they interact with an alien race, their prejudices are their own doing. And it's a morality tale about your own bigotry and whatever. And you go like, and that's valid in a very Twilight Zone way. Mm-hmm. But there's a part of you that goes like, well, what if they weren't so bad? And yeah. they and they just learned a lesson and then survived and moved on. And that's like really yeah, what they're And they keep going. And they keep going. Right, right. And then everybody learns more. And that's the thing about the serial that is... It's not just a cash grab. It's it's a it's a logical thing to be yeah. like, well, what if these people were like, well, I'm a rock man because I was in a storm, yeah, and now I'm dealing with aliens, and even though I'm a Jewish guy from Yancey Street, yeah, I'm willing to accept other crazy yeah. people, you well, know. Who am I to right cast yeah. stones? <laughs> <laughs> das Ding, <laughs> das Ding und das Fackel. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh. If you don't know who the Fantastic Four is, just stop listening to our show. <laughs> uh, the Fantastic Four were four civilians, Dr. Reed Richards, Ben Grimm, Susan Storm, and Johnny Storm, who get exposed to cosmic rays during a test flight. They survive a crash landing on Earth, and they finally develop superpowers. They commit to help using their powers to help people. Um, later on, they very, very quickly later on, they go on to become celebrities. It's wonderfully explained in a, oh gosh, I think in a late 2000s issue, Reed is explaining to Franklin about why he made them celebrities. Really? Yeah, and it's about his guilt for what he had done to his family, and especially Ben. And he said, I, I figured the... The only thing I could do was to make them popular. Yeah, make it a, Holy make shit, it a positive. Holy shit, that's fucking good. Yeah, yeah. yeah That's real good. It's really good. Yeah. But it's also a thing, too, where it's like it was a different approach that Marvel took, too, when mm-hmm. they go like... um no secret identities. No. They're like, no, they're 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 uh, public people, and they're also publicly relied upon. Mm-hmm. Spider Man can be a menace for some reason, right? But the Fantastic Four, totally oh. immune. Yeah, <laughs> Jane and Jonah Jameson. <laughs> well, they were no problem. They were they were space heroes in the same too. City. <laughs> they were space heroes too, which also yeah, they had the veteran thing yeah. too, yeah. which also plays into J Jonah's mm-hmm. son. Um. Uh, in in 2022, uh, so anyway, the first Fantastic Four was released in November 1961, and in 2022, a very well preserved copy of Fantastic Four number one sold for 1.5 million dollars at auction. Shit. He's still working from home, uh, making a couple trips a month to the Marvel offices. Uh, his kid said that he worked 14 to 16 hours a day, basically seven days a week, um, and they'd catch you know sneak peeks of the Marvel universe through a cloud of their dad's cigar smoke. <laughs> Wow. Which is honestly kind of cool. <laughs> Super awesome. Um, in Jan- I get all over this. <laughs> <laughs> January 62, they published the origin story of Hank Pym. Really? A- AKA the Ant Man. Stan Lee, Larry Liebert, Steve Ditko, and Jack Kirby. Five months later, they launched the Hulk. Maybe Doc- go, the, go the smallest to the biggest. Yeah. I just saw what if a guy was like real small? 
<laughs> and then one of her guy was like real big and mad. Well, yeah, the, you know, the, <laughs> the, uh, it sounded like Casey Kasem doing it. Uh, <laughs> the you know the Ant Man one, oh, uh, like like Spider Man would go on to be where they were just you know one offs in anthologies. Oh yeah, okay, sure. And then they're like, oh, that one hit. Let's keep going, right? Right, because that's what happened with Spider Man. Yeah. Five months later, after after launching the Man in the Ant Hill, which would go on to become Ant Man, uh, they launched the Hulk. Bruce Banner exposed to gamma radiation caused him to morph from the Hulk, uh, morph into the Hulk under stress. What uh, issue was that again? Uh, it like that, I, think, I think I think the Hulk was Incredible a stories. Or... Dude, on I think the Hulk might have been its own thing. It might have been an issue. It might have been issue one. Um, Kirby said he got the idea from when he saw a woman lift a car to save her baby. Baby was caught underneath the running board of this car. The woman, in desperation, lifted the rear end of the car. It suddenly came to me that in desperation, we can all do that. We can knock down walls. I created a character who did all that and called him the Hulk. That's, what a fucking amazing story! That's incredible. Holy Hulk. shit! Uh, yeah, I, this is a guy who's looking at every single thing that's happening. Go ahead. Yeah. And and he, he and, and he goes, look at this woman. Better make it a guy. <laughs> well, he goes, you know. He was also inspired by. Man. Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and uh, Frankenstein. Yeah, no, it, I mean, that's the real thing. Is it beca- yeah. like, you know, uh, when when uh, Stan lays it out in Mallrats, he's like a guy that's a, you know, he's like a, 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 a torrent of emotion one moment. You know, like, you know, uh, the, the Hulk really stands apart in that way where it is such a Jekyll and Hyde oh. thing. And it's not even like, it's hard to even corral it into the superhero thing. Yeah, it's it's just, just its own yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah, just uh, it's it for the longest time. It was the great unexplored character. But when, yes. they, when they did Immortal Hulk, when Al Ewing did Immortal Hulk yeah, Immortal uh, in the past, amazing. what decade or so? I mean, it just fucking blew the fucking doors off that character. Like I, it's finally not... really explored all the trauma mm-hmm. and and the psychosis of yeah. Bruce Banner. And, and it goes very much to uh, uh, in tone. I think you would agree. Like a uh, Swamp Thing. Like, oh, yeah, Elemental and... Um, enduring. Yeah. Uh, and, like, Beyond Good and Evil. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's... it's God, it's such a great piece of work. Um, but there, there's something really special about it in the way of, like, he... He doesn't necessarily want to ever be that guy. No! And then, no. And then the moments where he, he, he embraces it. Yeah. Right. There's, so there's all of these shifting emotions about him that is so much more interesting than someone who is like proud of it and wants to show it off. Right. What if your superpower is a fucking like gigantic burden? Right? Yeah. And and a danger to everybody you love. Yeah. In, yeah. A, in a different way than let's say Spider Man. And, yeah. and 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 this thing of being like, um, it's a it's a second set like of 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 eyelids, in a way where it's like one is like. Can, like, isn't it, isn't it absolutely horrific how much power I have? Mm-hmm. Yeah, isn't is, it? A, is, isn't it an abomination? An abomination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it's also kind of into the werewolf thing, mm-hmm. but even just even more so. It's it, it's it's even more elemental as opposed to being animalistic. Yes, it's yes. it's pure emotion. Yeah. Um. You know, I did a story called the Hulk. I, I thought the Hulk might might be like a Frankenstein. If I, I feel that there's a Frankenstein in all of us, I've seen it demonstrated. It would be my job to take a cliched concept and make it seem new and fresh and exciting and relevant. Um, August 62. They introduced the Mighty Thor in Journey into Mystery 83, written by Stan Lee and Larry Lieber, penciling by Don Heck, Jan Kirk, Jack Kirby, and Steve Ditko. Um, the Stone Men from Earth invade... Uh, the Stone Men from Saturn invade Earth. Uh, and this was when uh, the Mighty Thor was, had it, it was basically the avatar of... Um, uh, Dr. Donald Blake would get possessed. Correct. Yeah. He'd bang his, his walking stick yeah. on the ground and he'd become the mighty Thor, uh, God of Thunder. Uh, that same month, Spider Man debuts in Amazing Fantasy number 15. Yeah. Yeah, there really must have been a lot of puny people in America. <laughs> They're all, they needed them to turn into superheroes. Yeah, there was war rationing. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And you know, everybody was getting sand kicked in their face. <laughs> that's, that's right. Look at the, all the advertisements. I created Spider Man. We decided to give it to Steve Ditko. I drew the first Spider-Man cover. I created the character. I created the costume. I created all those books, but I couldn't do them all. He complimented Ditko's work. He said he did a wonderful job. No way. He's saying he completely created Spider-Man? Huh? No idea. Never knew. 
you know, Stan Lee would go on to say, like, I, I, I thought I saw a fly on the wall as I was in my <laughs> yeah. And I thought to myself, what if I could stick to the walls like that and peep around? Imagine, I, I said, imagine it was me crawling around <laughs> instead of, uh, like, a, you know, a spider or, like, a, a, a guy, but me, Stan Lee. With his head and these plugs. Yeah. The glasses. Um, so he says Steve Ditko did a wonderful job on that, uh, which he did. Uh, it's got and a, I think he did make it his own. Uh, dude, quite Steve, a Steve bit. Ditko yeah, yeah. is, you know, the prototypical Spider-Man artist. But yeah. yeah, if I remember correctly, Ditko had a version for the first cover, but they used Kirby's instead. Yeah, I think that's correct. Um, is that true? Yeah, yeah, where he's like, fine, he's got the guy. Yeah. That uh, was Kirby? <sighs> yeah. Wow. Um, you can You can point... Uh, he said, "He says Ditko's got a, a definite style you could recognize anywhere. You can point to any picture that Steve makes and say Ditko did that. It's individual." And Roz would uh, Roz chimed in during that interview and said, "They all look Polish." <laughs> <laughs> and Jack said, "Yeah, all his characters look Polish." <laughs> they laugh. They're always eating yeah. pierogies. Yeah. Uh, historians will confirm that Kirby showed Stan his concept art for Spider-Man, and they agreed on the characters' look. Kirby got the approval to draw the first story. Uh, he was about five pages in when he stopped working on it for unknown reasons. Um, his version of Spider-Man was um, more like Shazam in that he was a kid who turned into an adult superhero. Oh. As opposed to just being the teenager that he would always be. You know? Interesting. Um, so none of Kirby's Spider-Man pages survived. But he did draw the first two covers and some uh, guest star stories. First two covers meaning Amazing Fantasy and then Spider Man number one. Yeah. Wow. Um, Amazing Fantasy number 15 became one of Marvel's highest selling titles. Shocking, Martin Goodman. Uh, so he gives Lee the go ahead to do a Spider Man series. Do you know the numbers on that? Oh, God. It must have been uh, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Um, uh, back on Fantastic Four, August, again, August 19, fucking 62. Uh, very, very prolific. Big fucking month. First appearance of Doctor Doom. Wow. Another Jack Kirby creation. Just a man in a cave. Doctor Doom is an evil person, but he's not always been evil. He was a perfectionist. He gets a cut on his chin. The perfectionist suddenly finds himself imperfect, small as that scar may be, so he can't live with the rest of humanity. He can't live with himself, so he encases his face in an iron mask. It's really nailing the fucking character from the get. Really, the uh, jump. really brilliant. Um, you know, Stan would also say uh, that you know they're they're they wanted to make him look kind of like the Grim Reaper. Mm -hmm. That's why he's got like the mask is kind of skeletal and there's the hood. Um, so he was kind of like a stand-in for for uh, um, you know the Grim Reaper, which totally makes sense. Um, and he's big on that issue of Fantastic Four. Um, it's so much. I mean, more rich than that, though. Oh, without a doubt. Just because it's it's the thing of the guy behind the mask and like yeah. all of that tragedy of like, yeah. I mean, starting there with like things not being perfect. That's the char That is the character going forward. And, and, is like I know how perfect yeah. things can be. So that, let me do it. Right. But that means in the meantime, while things are not perfect. Y'all gonna suffer. Yeah. Yeah, like suffering is like, yeah, man, I know it sucks. It's not perfect. You think so, I like this? Yeah. I <laughs> think I'm having a good time. I'm wearing a fucking iron mask. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Dr. Doom. No one has it worse than me. People fear me. It's a real bummer. And I won't be liked until things are perfect. Yes. And then they'll love me. Yeah. They'll love me when I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. ah. So the first issue of Amazing Spider-Man drops in 63 in March. Um, it was Marvel's top-selling series from 1966 to 1969. Instantly a cultural icon. But it debuted in 63, you're saying? The first issue of yes. Amazing Spider-Man. Um, in 1965, when Esquire magazine polled college students about their favorite revolutionary icons, the top names were Che Guevara, Bob Dylan, The Hulk, and Spider-Man. Holy shit. Whoa. One interview he explained... Quote, beset by woes, money problems, and the question of existence. In short, he is one of us. Wow. God, that's fucking good. That <laughs> is. Like, I don't think a college student now could ever say anything so simple and eloquent without yeah. well, it re re referencing ask. fucking gender identity or some fucking <laughs> bullshit. <Jesus. laughs> so they could say something eloquent about it, you're saying. 
Nah. <laughs> It'd be a mumbled, jumbled mess with their fucking retainer in <laughs> or a cock in their mouth. Oh my god! You heard it. That's, but hold that's on, cool. Hold on. Let's let's also just say here. I mean, it's it's, it's interesting that Hulk gets in there. I mean, what maybe I like that might be like. I mean, that was always one that I was fascinated. Like it's, it's Marvel's force of nature. Yeah. Um. And and we also have to say too. Uh, when you read Doomsday Clock, you told me Doc, uh, Doctor Manhattan looks at Superman in DC and he says, "I see somewhere where you're going to uh, engage with a, a green monster from this universe." Right. And um. And so it's like it's it's funny that it's like Doctor Manhattan and Superman. Marvel's version of that, the closest thing to that, is the Hulk, which is, the, oh, Doomsday, the most far, like flawed of any of them. Like Marvel, Marvel's closest analog to Doomsday is the Hulk. To, to uh, uh, or uh, or even Superman and and Doctor Manhattan themselves in terms of strength. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you've got like the Sentry, and you've got the yeah, Guardian. We're, we're, you've got some of those like not talk about alien the characters, but like. <laughs> And Thor is kind Turbo, of Superman American has Gladiators. has become, Superman. but the most like unstoppable force is the Hulk. Is the Hulk, yeah. and and he's he's by far the most flawed of by, oh. those three. If we're talking, if we're if we're going Watchmen universe, yeah, DC universe, and Marvel universe, yeah, the unstoppable force there is the Hulk, and he's like, I don't even know if I'm sane, bro. <laughs> yeah. I think I might be really fucked I've, up. And I've been know, hearing some voices. And yeah. I don't know what to do about it at all. You know Dr. I mean? Manhattan is beyond sane. Like, yeah. He's so sane that he's detached. Yeah. Superman is just too much of a nice guy. Yeah. And the Hulk is just like, smash! But then even so, but even at this time, uh, and and uh, there's the nuance there too uh, with Dr. Doom where you go like, um, his name is Dr. Doom. On paper, on a cereal box, whatever. Classic villain. Mm -hmm. But then, like, if you just, like, read what children could read at the beginning of these stories, you go, like, this guy actually, like, is just very, you know, very derailed and fucked up, but, like, he's got some good points. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? It's so he's fucked making up. making a lot of sense. Like, yeah. you know, like, you know who you I actually... You hand it to him. You know who I actually got... Got a, a lot of good ideas. <laughs> yeah, you know who's got good ideas? Dr. Doom. <laughs> Um, he was masking before it was cool. <laughs> Tales of Suspense, number 39, May 1963, Iron Man. Mm -hmm. um, Don Heck, John, uh, Jack Kirby do the artwork. Later that month, Nick Fury comes on the scene with Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, number one. Wow, that late? Yes. I thought they were like around, no? No. Well, no, you... but, but very much based on his... Yeah. Experience in the war. Yeah, so, you know, I was going to say, like, cigar. Or yeah. The... There was a reality in the yeah. stories because of my own war experiences. Sergeant Fury had the essence of military life in it. Um, uh, in 62, Stan was telling Goodman that the comic style that he and Kirby developed was responsible for Marvel's new success, and this could work on any genre. To prove they could get a hit in an outdated genre like war comics, they made Sergeant Fury, the war mag for people who hate war mags. Hmm. Nice. Um, Stan wanted to come up with another superhuman team, uh, because things were doing, they were fucking banger after banger after banger and teams are hot. Uh, and, but this time they, they don't get an origin story. Uh, we talked about this maybe on the, um, on the Patreon last night. Stan said, you know, I said to myself, why don't I just say they're mutants? They're born that way. Yeah. Enough with the cosmic rays and the, mm -hmm. yeah, the accidents, yeah, the nuclear yeah. shit. Yeah. But it also took that thing where you're like, well, if you're born with it, it's not Maybelline. Uh, no, hold on. Yeah, no, but yeah, seriously, yes. but, but it is a we, thing. Hey, we can excuse an accident, but it, if you're born with it, it's worse. Yeah. It's even less. It's Yeah, but, you know, that's such as human nature. Um, Kirby would take credit for the group. He said, I did the natural thing there. I said, what would you do with mutants who were just plain boys and girls and certainly not dangerous? You school them. You develop their skills. So I gave them a teacher, Professor X. Instead of disorienting or alienating people who were different from us, I made the X-Men part of the human race. I felt that if we train the mutants our way, they'll help us, and not only help us, but achieve a measure of growth, and so we could all live together. Uh, in the documentary Kirby at War, um, one of the, one of the, basically Kirby scholars kind of posits that, uh, 
he put Professor X in the wheelchair because of his own time uh, in the war when he had frostbite and trench foot. And really? He was confined to a wheelchair, and he was like, I'm fucking, I'm here, but my, my, my mind still works. Yeah. yeah. Um, Pretty cool. Fucking very cool. Uh, Martin uh, uh, Goodman turned down the, the proposed title, The Mutants, because readers wouldn't know what a mutant was, so Stan is credited coming up with the name of the X-Men. Uh, X-Men number one publishes in 1963. Kirby is credited with creating or co-creating Professor X, Beast, Cyclops, Jean, Ray, Jean Grey, Iceman, Juggernaut, Magneto, Scarlet Witch, Toad, and Quicksilver. Wow. Full list will be at the end of the episode. If anybody It'll would take like to, a while. If anybody would like to hear uh, John's thoughts on Cyclops, please tune to the Patreon. Yeah. Don't get him started on a Chinese Cyclops. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, Nick Fury was played by a guy with two eyes. <laughs> that was weird. And one time, a white guy and a black guy. Uh, Kirby's design for Magneto's costume remained virtually unchanged for decades. Uh, even current X Men comics, the movies, mm-hmm. all show the influence of Jack Kirby. Uh, also, September 63, The Avengers. Wow. Same fucking month. Original roster Iron Man, Ant Man, Hulk, Thor, and the Wasp. In issue number four, the Avengers find Captain America trapped in ice. They revive him, and he joins the squad. Yeah. yeah. Uh, they won an Alley Award in 63 for favorite short story, The Human Torch Meets Captain America. In Strange Tales number 114, they won Alley Awards in 64 for Captain America Joins the Avengers from Avengers number four. And Do you know if that's the original Human Torch Meets Captain America? Or? Uh, that must be uh, Johnny Storm. That, Johnny Storm. Okay. At that point, it's Johnny Storm. Interesting. Uh, he brings in the Inhumans to Fantastic Four in 1965. The Inhumans... Really? Yeah. He created the Inhumans as well. The Inhumans, uh, parallel race to human beings. They live on the fucking moon. It's, yeah. Uh, they live in a kingdom called Atalan. And this is... Um, Matt, I don't know if I sent you some imagery of that. Let's see here. Um, but you can kind of see the influence... Of let's 65. see, uh, look at um, actually, I sent you an Eternals by Jack Kirby, uh-huh. uh, but the, we'll get to the Eternals as well. But you can really see the the his fondness for Aztec and Mesoamerica's uh, design motifs, uh-huh. um, large scale scale mosaics, intricate works of stone, gold, and silver. Um, the Mighty Thor gets his own series in March of 1966. And he says, I love Thor because I love legends. Stan Lee was the type of guy who would never know about Balder and who would know about the rest of the characters, so I had to build up that legend of Thor in the comics. I took a great joy with inventing new kinds of mechanisms, machinery. I invented new kinds of machines. I'm very well versed in science fact and science fiction. I know our own place in the universe. I can feel the vastness of it inside myself. I began to realize with each passing fact what a wonderful and awesome place the universe is, and that helped me in comics because I was looking for the awesome. I found it in Thor. Wow. God damn it. Um, so uh, there's some... St- I sent you... There is... This guy gets started cults pretty quick. <sighs> yeah. Well, it kind of uh, well, has. Uh, well, there's actually... <laughs> there's some interesting stuff there. So I there's a picture nice. of Asgard and the Rainbow Bridge uh, there. Uh, that's some uh, that's some classic Kirby art. If you want to throw it up on the screen, uh-huh. taste the rain, bro. It looks a, a gold emerald city with the rainbow bridge. And if you know, if you see the original Thor movie or you watch Ragnarok, straight up Kirby, especially yeah. Ragnarok. It's like maybe the most Kirby movie next to Eternals or something. In it, gen- actually, it, even more so. In general, just I mean, if you're talking about. Uh, uh... So that's Asgard. That's the rainbow bridge being broken. Mm-hmm. Um. If you look at uh, then the Eternals there, um, you can see uh, the kind of Mesoamerican style. Yep. Mm. Uh, and then you can also see, if you look at, uh, maybe I think the first one I sent you is Hela. Uh, especially, this is in Ragnarok. If you watch Ragnarok and you, mm-hmm. you think that they came up with what Hela looks like with that headdress, you're wrong because that was Jack Kirby. In I know. And that's, I mean, that's the thing uh, Liefeld says about, uh, you know, Kang. He goes like, but like, they're like, there's no improvements needed. No, like, just leave it exactly that way. Um, and it's because it's always an audacious thing. It's always like a like a very specific 
very audacious design that is singular. Yeah. And, and any any and it just to endures. It just takes it yeah. And the Im- Doctor Doom, Iron Mask, mm-hmm. Hood. End of end of list. Yeah. And you're like Kang, you go like, I don't know, man. He's like, is it a helmet? Is it his face? Is it his face? Is he no man and every man? You know, it's purple, it's green. The the colors are like shocking and they're cool. Um but yeah, all of that stuff endures so well. And it that's really, I mean, you know, the thing like we know as comic fans, because we know old shit before these movies ever come out. Yeah. And when we see it and like when the movies come out and you're like, oh, this is like a fucking like spectacular version yeah. of a thing Jack Kirby came up with. Yeah. It, it's fucking years 50 ago. years ago. Yeah. It's amazing. And, and finally. Yeah. Like only now. Have we had the and means and, and the and the know how and the motivation and a thing where it's like it, does, it doesn't have to look preposterous yeah. yeah because when you're reading a comic you're in your imagination yeah you know and he did such a good job of bridging that gap without overdoing it like we talked about on the Patreon like you can overdo it with 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 showing too much but he did just sure. enough to kind of mirror what was going on in your imagination and let your imagination do the rest uh, the second to last picture I sent you Matt. Uh, is the Kirby Crackle. Um, you'll know it when you see it. It is uh, the clusters of black dots and circles that show basically cosmic energy. Yes. Um, oh, yeah. So that's a that's a big one there. Yeah, uh, it works so well. Sunspot, the X-Men yeah. uses it, the, uh, the Power Cosmic with Silver Surfer. Uh, if you go to Disneyland and if you go to California Adventure... Where they the old Tower of Terror is now the Guardians of Galaxy um, escape, mm-hmm. and the uh, the story behind the ride is that an interdimensional rift has opened, and the collector, yeah, Tavon, his collection has dropped in the middle of California Adventure, and around the pay like they separate. There's two different types of like cement and paint and and groundwork, mm-hmm. and it is sep- it's it's delineated by Kirby Crackle on the ground. Very cool! Wow, it's incredible. Yeah, um, it does. It, it works so well. You know exactly what it means. Yeah, and it's it, it's a thing where you go like, I just know it's heavy. Like I know it's heavy in a way that's like beyond uh, my understanding. Right. Yeah, you there's know. some sort of a the visual about it that makes it not earthly. You know, the, 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 yeah. the circle. They, like they, if they it say, was if it was just flames, but you go like, what if we put like uh, frothy little bubbles in there that are black? Yeah, and you're like, oh, that sounds fucked up. Yeah, yeah. It, <laughs> like, it, it, it can't be from it, here. It works on your imagination yeah. so well. Um, they, they, it's it's positive that it may have come from him seeing photos of quasars, which were discovered in 1963. Really? As he was studying things like popular science, popular mechanics. Wow. Seems like a pretty good thing to study if you're in this type of yeah. work. You know? Yeah. Um, the most, you know, the most mature form of the crackle you, you can see in Thor and Fantastic Four because they're the most cosmic mm-hmm. of the stories up until that point. Um, historians of comics have found traces of the crackle all the way back in Simon and Kirby's Blue Bolt number five in October 1940. Maybe we can pull that up at some point. Issue number 48 of the Fantastic Four drops in 1966, and this is the introduction of Galactus and the Silver Surfer. Oh, My, oh is that late? Yeah. Wow. I but I mean, know. you know, Fantastic Four had been around for five years at this point, and now... I thought it was so much earlier. Yeah, uh, it wasn't. But, dude, that, it set it off on a whole other situation. It, it, my conception of the Silver Surfer was from a human being from, say, from space in that particular form, Came in when everybody was surfing. Wow. I read about it in the paper. The kids in California were beginning yeah. to surf. I couldn't just draw any ordinary fucking teenager surfing, so I got I put a dude from outer space on it. I don't do teens. <laughs> I had to make sales and come up with characters that weren't stereotyped, so I went to the Bible. Silver Surfer, of course, is a fallen angel. When Galactus relegates him to Earth, he stays on Earth, and that was the beginning of his adventures. Galactus is in actuality sort of God. He's beyond reproach, beyond anybody's opinion um in that way he's kind of a zeus who fathered hercules he is he is he is his own legend and of course he and the silver surfer are sort of modern legends and they are designed that way Mm. um the galactus trilogy ran from march through may of 66 fantastic four was the 19th highest comic selling comic title of 66 with an average 
of 329,000 copies of every issue being sold. And that's 19th best. If a comic today sells 300,000, it's by far and away number wow. one. I, Only I, Spider-Man outsold, outsold them in Marvel. Sorry. Yeah. I found the, uh, the, the, the origin of Kirby Crackle. Oh, Kirby B. Crackle? There it is. There's yeah, book. man. There it is. Straight yeah. from the Kirby Museum. From 1940. Wow. Looks like Dr. Fate almost behind from, from behind. What that ass? Uh the helmet and the oh. <laughs> I uh I, I um here here's here's his uh here's one of uh, Silver Surfer. Yeah. Six. This stuff, man, I mean, holy shit, dude, because like, you know, when I think about this stuff, uh the cosmic stuff, of of course I, I usually go to Jim Starlin, but you just realize and, and Liefeld says this too. He goes, he's like we all took from Kirby. Yes. He goes, there's, Espe- and especially like, there's no, how could you not? There's I mean, no choice. Yeah. You have to. And especially if you're dealing with his properties. Yeah. But um, it, it's crazy that it, it spans Captain America, Spider Man, X Men, fucking Eternal. Fantastic Four, Eternal. Like, it's, it is great. It's, it's the, nobody it's, was more prolific. It's the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Yeah. It is his universe. Yeah. I mean, fuck. Uh, let's see. Only Spider-Man outsold him at Marvel. Uh, in 66, Fantastic Four Ultra also introduces the Black Panther. He's the king and protector of futuristic African nation Wakanda. Uh, he was the first comics mainstream, first, uh, mainstream comic hero of African origin. Kirby would say, I realized I had no blacks in my strip. I never drawn a black. I needed a black. I suddenly discovered that I had a lot of black readers. My first friend was a black. And here I was ignoring them because I was associating with everybody else. Excuse me. Readers were fan of Child, but he wouldn't get his own series until 1977. Really? Damn. Yeah. Oh. And it, it, is, it, it is worth noting that in the first appearance of uh, the Black Panther in the Fantastic Four, he whoops their ass. Yes, yeah, really. I remember that. Badly. Yeah. Uh, and they do, uh, they, put, they put some respect on his name quite early. Yeah. Like, what's uh, going on with this black guy? Oh, oh I don't like, know. It's clobbering time. I don't like the way he smell. Oh my God, Jesus! Don't say you're quoting. Uh, fall of '66. He's he's going even more into the uh, Marvel space mythos. Ego, the living planet, appears in Thor 133. Incredible! Just such a such a great idea. I began to experiment, and that's how Ego came about. A planet that was alive, a planet that was intelligent. So I felt somewhere out there in the universe, it becomes denser turns to liquid and that in this liquid there was a giant multiple viruses and if it remained isolated for millions and millions of years it would begin to evolve by itself and it would begin to think by the time it reached it it might be quite superior to us and that was ego weird and it's worth noting that that there is also there is a uh, i guess a metaphysical concept called the boltzmann brain and it has to do with according to what we know about uh entropy and the universe and probability and quantum physics that it is on paper more likely for a brain to just evolve in space floating out of nowhere than to have the universe that we know today and so it's interesting i'd be inter- i didn't i didn't look up uh, where how they they cross in that venn diagram about how the boltzmann brain relates to ego the living planet yeah. but there is a concept in in in, yeah. in, in, in I guess it was cosmic philosophy, right? About a brain in space. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Um, fucking ego, the living fucking planet. <laughs> it's, it's just such a good idea. Just when you're in this business, you take a little idea and you go, "What if it was?" Yeah, I an idea that we all know in abstract form, maybe, and then make it. Oh, it's not a yeah. physical form. Oh shit, ego. Oh, I know him. Wait, wait, you're saying Earth's a living planet? But not that one. No, this guy's got a real fucking ego on him. Yeah. The name the naming conventions, you know, Doctor sure, Doom. Sure. Hey, hey. Of course. Hey. Leave a little bit to be desired, but readers weren't that sophisticated. Mm. Uh what do you say we take a break? Let's okay. take a quick break. We'll be right back, folks. And we're back. Jack. Kirby. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, 
May 1967, Esquire magazine publishes Kirby's three-page illustrated story about Jack Ruby, the man who killed President Cassidy, Ke- President Kennedy's <laughs> also, supposed you know. assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, then he shot those three guys on the grassy knoll, too, just for yeah, good just, just to, you know, <laughs> you got a full clip. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 68. Tony Stark gets his own title with Iron Man number one, and soon he's leading a new version of the Avengers with Thor, Ant-Man, the Wasp, and the Hulk. Marvel has never stopped publishing Iron Man and Avengers stories. Okay, wait. <laughs> Wasn't the first Avengers with Iron Man? Yes, but it didn't. Uh, it was not Ant-Man and the. Uh, this is a new version that had Thor, and uh, uh, let's see, uh, Ant-Man. Then the first one was. Thor, the Hulk, Iron Man, and the Wasp. This oh. one now has Ant Man. Yeah. Okay. That year, Key, uh, Kirby wins the Alley Award for Best Penciler. Um, some of the stories that he wrote also won awards. Sixty-eight. He moves. Uh, they moves the family to Thousand Oaks. Uh, he said he had a nice. gut. He had a gut full of New York. He could also be closer to uh, some of the LA media companies. Uh, in 69, a professor at UC Santa Cruz Theater Department asks the Marvel offices if they have an artist who'd be interested in doing costume design for their production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. Wow. Stan thought of Kirby in Southern California, and he put the two in touch. Kirby not only designed the costumes, but he did the artwork for the posters, handbills, programs, all shit. for free. Whoa. Um, the journalist Mark Herbert asked... asked puzzlingly about his proximity to the divine and Kirby said I feel I am God because these things are living or moving to my concepts good or bad that's how they come out I can even punish them by erasing them but I'm not that mad I'm not that mad yet I like to make them as perfect as I can and now I feel and I feel now that's what God is doing with us um moving to LA would do that yeah I'll give you God complex uh he was frustrated that he had curated or co-created so many characters from Marvel without holding a copyright over them or having any custody creatively and not having any final say in the character storylines or destinies. Um, so he, he had been envisioning comic series that would be collected into a single volume after its conclusion and sold outside newsstands, graphic novels. Mm-hmm. Um, he had showed Stan his sketches for a new group of heroes and villains, the New Gods. Stan approved, but he wanted to fold the characters into existing Marvel titles. Kirby said, no, I'm going to keep these for myself. His project, The Fourth World, would include titles like Mr. Miracle, The New Gods, and The Forever People. Carmine Infantino at DC had visited the Kirby's at Passover in 69, and uh, he pitched it to Carmine and got The uh, the New Gods over at DC. Wow. And uh, um, he, he had been, he'd been marinating this you know, his own kind of uh, divine mythology ever since he started working on Tales of Asgard with Thor back in um, back in the 60s. Um, and he wanted to have two planets at war end with the Ragnarok, the battle that would kill Thor's pantheon. Um, instead, he, he tried that idea with the Inhumans. It didn't really work. And so he, he took it over to New Gods and uh, basically showed that same concept except without Thor and Asgard and did it with um, wow. a, what would become Apocalypse and New Genesis. Right. Um, he left Marvel around somewhere around Fantastic Four 102. Um, he just he just felt like Marvel was didn't give him all the respect and, and, and credit he deserved. So, and he is God now. He is God. So DC, they, they start running huge ads in their books saying that the word from on high is that the great one is coming. <laughs> Advertising that Jack Kirby was coming to DC Comics. Yeah. Um, he was offered Superman. Wouldn't take it. Really? Insisted on working on Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen. <laughs> Didn't have any assigned talent, so he uh, uh, he he felt that uh, he wouldn't be taking someone's job away. Wow. He took that Jimmy Olsen job because he wouldn't be putting somebody else out of a job. Wow. His first cool issue, guy. <laughs> uh-huh. uh, first issue that he did was number 133 in 1970. The series started making money. Uh, he started um, having more creative control uh, totally in that comic, except when it came to drawing Superman. He would draw Superman and they'd swap it out with some other artist. 
Really? They didn't they didn't tell him and he did not like it. Yeah, that's really fucked up. Fucked up. Yeah. They just didn't like how he drew Superman. They're like, nah, dude. Wait, yeah, do, do you... Man, what is his... He Superman? said, um, I didn't hurt Superman. I made him powerful. I admire Superman, but I've got to do my own style. But they... Uh, Kurt Swan... DC had artist Kurt Swan redraw every Superman head that Kirby made in Jimmy Olsen to make it look more like their standard Superman. Interesting. He probably had too much emotion and... and yeah. Gesture in it, you know. Yeah, um, that's real. It's also very illustrative of uh, DC and their top down. Like we yeah. have a look. You yeah. must do that, even if you're bigger than us. Yeah, yeah. And Superman's a man, you know. Yeah. Maybe he did them all fucked up. Who knows? <laughs> and he got all lines on his face. He gave an earring. Yeah. Yeah. Some kind of cyclops. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, his first issue of The New Gods launched in February 1971. It was 49 in this time. Drawing as many as 75 pages a month. Wow. Jesus Christ, man. Fucking nuts. How is his, Unreal how is his numbers. hand? Unreal His hand is... How, it's real labor, dude. Yeah. I mean, still working in that, you know, straight back chair. Excuse yeah. me, straight back chair. That is labor. Yeah. He said, I like working hard. Not only that, but if you look at some of my old pages, notice the expressions on the people. They're very real expressions. I was totally immersed in the characters. I penciled fast. I wrote fast. Nobody could have written it for me because they couldn't have understood the situation or what to do. Um, you've got, uh, like I said, you've got New Genesis. You've got Apocalypse. New Genesis is a good planet with nice scenery and their compassionate ruler, the High Father. Apocalypse is a polluted mechanical hellscape ruled by Darkseid. He created Darkseid to be the lead antagonist of this fourth world saga. He modeled Darkseid's look after Jack Palance's villain robot in the movie Westworld. Wow. Personality was Hitler crossed with Nixon. <laughs> uh, I remember incredible. hearing that. I remember hearing that. Uh, Orion was the star character of New Gods, and he would go to Apocalypse to confront Darkseid and then follows him to Earth where their war will be won or lost, but Orion doesn't know that Darkseid is his father, going back to Kimbellian mythos, and this is before Star Wars. Um, Darkseid sees the anti-life equation, which grants control over free will itself. He also controls the Omega Beams, which are very famously unavoidable beams of destruction that shoot from his eyes. Yeah. However, in one comic book, Batman does dodge the Omega Beams. Why? Because plot armor. Ah, he's a little <laughs> detective. You know. um, he detected them. Darkseid would make some cameos in his Jimmy Olsen comic book, like in uh, issue number 134 in 1970. Um, he would make a, his first full appearance in uh, another fourth world book called The Forever People, number one. Um, he would go on to move beyond the fourth world to become a, a formidable foe for the Justice League and Superman. And we've talked about it before. Thanos is a ripoff mm -hmm. of Darkseid. Yeah. Color, facial features. Mm-hmm. Desire for uh, well, apocalypse. Uh, I'm sorry, dark side seeks the anti life equation, right? Uh, and <laughs> the Than equation. Thanos is, seeks to impress the Le cosmic entity Lady Death, yes, yes, by destroying half of the universe, yeah. um, which is a form of anti death or anti life. You could say that death yeah. is a form of anti life, yeah. you could say that. Yeah. I, I'm not gonna endorse it, but some people, they also don't. somewhere along the line, there, I remember there was. Maybe you saw this in the same documentary I did. I don't remember what it's from. But they were talking about the earliest iterations of Thanos and how he's much skinnier. Yeah. And then somebody was like, bulk him up. They're like, if stretch you, it out left to right. They're like, if yeah. you're ripping off dark side, just do it. They just said that. They were like, yeah. lean into it. There should be more uh, chubby villains. Yeah, he basically has... I think it's thick with two Cs. <laughs> yes, no, I mean, you're yeah. right. He's, he's quite it's, muscular. Uh, we never see him working out, but he does. Yes. It's Hulk thick. Yeah. Mm. It's nice. Yeah. It's nice. Um, a little grab. And, you know, hey, have you seen the Snyder Cut? Dark Side is tight. Mm -hmm. Dark Side is They tight. do a really good job with the little bit of Dark Side they throw in there. Um, you know, fuck Joss Whedon. Uh, uh, the material in New Gods um, had a strong start, but it started to slip. Never really um, reached that same uh, peak that it had early on. Then it had the Forever People, which were another group of the new gods from New Genesis. They come to Earth to oppose Darkseid. Uh, they they look like hippies. They just so happen to look like hippies. 
Very um, cool. But Dark this, Side should love that. Dude, Dark Side, man, come on. They they're they are another team. They can join together. They can summon Infinity Man with a mother box. Mother box, another yeah. convention yeah. from the DC. And universe. that's like an amp we plays guitar on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Peter Frampton thing. Yeah. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh for other people, number one also introduced the boom tube tech which is heavily featured in uh, Justice League animated series and, and the comic books and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, basically a transportation device. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, there's some stuff like his brother dying and stuff. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, and then... It doesn't matter. And then, you know... It's, it's, not what we're, it's not what we're doing the profile. And then in the comics... Uh, <laughs> uh, the character, Mr. Miracle. Introduced in Mr. Miracle number one. The character name is Scott Free. Uh, April 1971. He was a super escape artist imprisoned, um, no, ra- rather, um, inspired by uh, Jim Steranko. Really? Jim Steranko, before he was the Jim Steranko uh, of, of comic book fame, had previously worked as an escape artist. Really? <laughs> and uh, so the character Scott Free grew up in an orphanage on Apocalypse and was always making his way out of one bind or another. And he doesn't want to have anything to do with the new gods. He just wants to be an escape artist on Earth and <laughs> escape his own past. Wow. Uh, Scott's love interest introduced Big Barda, another character from uh, the DC mythos. Um, he based uh, her look on actress-singer Lainey Kazan, who had just appeared in Playboy the year prior. Wow. He's, uh, he said, Which he read for the tits. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Not the articles. Articles, dude. Yeah. It's a visual media. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I Scott- don't do jeans. <laughs> <laughs> Scott and Bidbarga's relationship was based on his and Roz's marriage. Aww. Um, so he's at DC. You know, Marvel is like, fuck, God, did we just let go like the fucking greatest guy, right? We, You know, we're not paying him, so it gives a shit. <laughs> Uh, one thing Fuck that, them anyway, one, right? One thing they didn't like was Kirby creating characters like Funky Flashman in Mr. Miracle Number 6 in 1972. Funky Flashman is a sleazy businessman modeled on Stan Lee. <laughs> and he has a, a side, he's got a sidekick named House Roy, a character of Stan's right-hand man, Roy Thomas. Jesus, little on the nose there. House Roy. Funky Flasherman here. Excelsior! <laughs> Come on. Yeah, Funky Flashman, really bad hair plugs. Uh, <laughs> insists on himself. <laughs> I mean, this is petty. I love it. Yeah, yeah. House Roy? I thought, I thought house Roy. As opposed to House Boy. Or House Black Guy. Well, yes, but I, yes. But I told you about the thing with uh, Starlin in, in the Warlock comic where they were like, you know, I, 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 I started to think this is early warlock. Adam Warlock. And uh they go at the beginning of the issue it was like dedicated to Steve Ditko, who always showed us like what was up or that was like the the gist of it. Adam Warlock goes into this thing where he's like, uh, you know, his mind is controlled, you know, because he's captive in this thing, whatever. <laughs> and uh you feel are trying to like, you know, put some, like, huge, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, lie to him in his mind, but he views them as clowns. Yeah. And they're all clowns that are, like, made to look like guys Editors. like yeah. Stan Lee and Roy Thomas and those yeah. guys and stuff. And I was going, like, man, this is, like, super inflammatory. It's Marvel Comics, and the guy's, like, just calling them out. He's not making any mistake about how oh, they look. It's like look. Jim Shooter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But once I saw dedicated to Steve Ditko, I was like, oh, here he goes. Yep, he's on one. <laughs> yeah. uh, Funky Flashman and House Roy lived off an inheritance, and when Funky's allowances started dwindling, he looks at Scott Free as a new income source. Jesus. Mr. Miracle lasted the longest of all the Force World titles. Wow. I think Mr. Um, oh, no, Mr. Terrific is in the new James Gunn stuff. Um, uh, let's see. Uh Eventually, the new, Gen- new Genesis and Apocalypse War uh, would get canceled, and it never saw it, w- it wasn't resolved at any time uh, soon. 
Uh, but he did try and get the rights to the Planet of the Apes comics, but Marvel got it instead. Mm. Uh, and he asked Kirby to make up a similarly themed series, even though he hadn't seen any of the movies. <laughs> but the, he knew the movie's rough outline, and he already made that story called, uh, what was it, The Last Enemy, years and years ago, about a guy who came back to Earth, and the animals were ruling the planet, and at war with each other. Um, he also still had Commandy of the Caves, which went on to be very popular. Um, people wanted more Commandy. B- DC put it on a um, monthly publishing title right away. Um, uh, Commandy kept running uh, until 78. Um, and then there was, you know, kind of just uh, around that time, comics were, were just kind of taking a dump yeah. in general. So it was one of many casualties. Well, like 70? 78. Oh, 78. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's always an ebb and flow with them. Uh, by this time, Kirby's house was getting visits from comic book artists, publishers, Jax fans, and at least one UFO cult. The Kirby kids recalled that this cult was on the way to meet the mothership, but they wanted to call on Jack first because they were big fans. Roz invited them in and made everybody sandwiches. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Oh. Well, so long. Uh, See y'all later. Get DC, DC act Jack asked Jack to create a new superhero separate from the fourth world uh, mythos. Uh, and um, Carmine Infantino suggested a monster. So over dinner at a Hojo's Howard Johnson in California, nice. he came up with Etrig and the Demon. Um, Etrig and the Demon you'll see in some of like the uh, DC animated stuff. Okay. He kind of speaks in, um, he kind of looks like a gargoyle. And he speaks in rhyme almost all like it's, he speaks poetically all the time. Mm-hmm. Great character. Um, based in Gotham, teams up with Batman. Uh, he's violent, but he usually aligns with good guys. Like Batman. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, then uh, usually while he's <laughs> while he's at DC in seventy four, Joe Simon and him team up one last time and they re- they bring back Sandman again. Hmm. Um that lasts for about a year. Uh, he does OMAC, uh, the one man army corps, which is kind of like a super technological version of captain America. Mm -hmm. A guy gets put into a machine and he's made into like a one man army thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so he's, he's working for DC, but he does go back to Marvel, uh, in the late seventies. um, and he is kind of, um, people know who he is now. Um, Thank God. Yeah. He stars on an epi- he guest stars on an episode of Starsky and Hutch. Damn. Wow. Okay. So like, like regular. Yeah. You know, sitcom. Yeah. Uh, uh, America celebrates his bicentennial in July of 76. So they celebrate the debut of uh, his new team, the Eternals. He creates the Eternals. Number one, um, and so you know, uh, created by the Celestials, based a l- very heavily on uh, Greek and Roman mythological characters. Yeah, some of the names are like just spelled a little bit differently. Right, uh, but it's like Ares and all that. Yeah, shit. yeah Icarus yeah. and Circe. And yeah. I'm they- sorry, I just want to go back. What did the Duke boys think about Jack Kirby? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> sound Jewish. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, what is? Hey. What is he doing? He doodled all over the General Lee. <laughs> Get him. It's a, it's a fly over a river. I... <laughs> <laughs> he put the Kirby crackle on the, on the Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> the hell? <laughs> Look at that cosmic furor. <laughs> um, 1976, Marvel publishes Kirby's adaptation of 2001 A Space Odyssey. Yes. We heard about this on the Lightfield podcast. That's right. Of course. Based yeah. on the Kubrick film and Arthur C. Clarke film slash novel. Um, wh- uh, that was part of the deal of moving to Marvel is that they, they promised that he could do that. Oh, wow. Um, Crazy. It was published in tabloid size 11 by 17 as opposed to standard comic book size 6 by 6 by 10 and a quarter. It went on to become a 10 issue monthly series that expanded on the concepts presented in the film and the novel. He wrote and penciled the series and it went on. For almost a year. Damn. Uh, then he goes on to create Machine Man. Uh, take a guess. Mm-hmm. It's a guy who's a machine. 
Transformers. Um, then does Devil Dinosaur. Uh, Devil Huge. Dinosaur is really big, uh, and it, it, I guess it's kind of coming back in a big way. Now it's Moon Girl and Devil Dinosaur when it was Moon Boy and Devil Dinosaur. Matt, I think I sent you... Devil Dinosaur is one of the we- very, like... When you talk about... And, like, So this is one that I, I, I don't know anything about, and I do hear uh, Rob Liefeld bring it up a lot on the podcast. The and- art's incredible. Like that, I When I see the art from Devil Dinosaur, which we'll pull up, like... That's where it's like, oh, this is like um, Sukalski or Dali. Like this is oh, really? this is print worthy work. It's super impressionistic and, wow, yeah, yeah. and psychedelic. It's a uh, it's a real the the evolution of his style. Yeah, when you go and you look at the original Captain America, and then yeah. you go like, dude, when did you take acid? Yeah, yeah. And look, look what he's doing with the cosmic uh, Kirby. Yeah, yeah the crackles uh, everywhere. The crackle, yeah. There's eyes everywhere. You know, Ditko. I mean, when Ditko would do Doctor Strange, you see a lot of that. Yes, yeah. You yeah, see you a lot of. You can't not. You can't uh, separate the two. This, I mean, that's for that is art gallery worthy. And I, I think, I think, I don't. You know, I might be talking about it out of my ass here, but that color scheme on the the uh, the character there. It's is something I you know out of some sort of um, as techy. I mean, yeah, I feel again, like again, again back to the Mesoamerican. Yes, yeah, yeah. He yeah. was really, really influenced by this. It reminds me a lot of um, there was a documentary that came out on Netflix a while ago. It was produced by Leonardo DiCaprio because the, Leo actually had some interaction with this guy as a youth. Um, uh, Sokolsky. Yeah, you showed me the doc. Yeah. yeah, and I have his. I have a couple of his books, and yeah. like this guy's art is. Like it was all, it was lost because of the war. Most of it, a lot of it was destroyed. But he did have some of his original, you know. Uh, and the vision is singular, unlike anything. It's any, it, yeah. Uh, uh, like it, it, it both. Just like a thing where like you capture like Greek, just a, and like Mesoamerican yeah, yeah, and a, Native American, and then mix. space, yeah. and yeah. like it's a, it's both a, horrifying and beautiful at the same time. A real world that. Like you can inhabit, and you go like, it's unlike anything you've ever yeah. seen, right? But also it's strangely familiar. Yes, yes uncanny, yeah. right? It's, it's it's that it's that Plato, four or five uh, different types squeezed down into the, and you're like, it, I, it's so horrifying, but so strangely familiar. Yeah, uh, there's a great, gosh, he, I'm gonna butcher the quote, but in it, you know, basically but the, the story of Sokolsky, it, you know. The guy was lost to history, and then the guy was looking him up, and, and he finds out that he's fucking just living in Granada Hills. So he just takes a fucking VHS camcorder and starts interviewing the guy, and the guy pulls out all his original manuscripts and stuff, and he sells it. He's like, you know, <laughs> after all this, I find myself living in a cultural Siberia yeah. of Los Angeles, and it was just yeah. like the fucking pain and anguish on this guy's face. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Struggle is the documentary. Uh, Struggle is also the name of the book. It worthy of a profile on its own, but you, uh, I mean, go watch the documentary. Yeah, yeah. The art is, it, but it's just another one of those amalgam styles that is so singular on on its own. It's, yeah. it's the work of, uh, and genius. also fascinating as a you know tiny trivia aside that it comes from Leo's dad being an underground comics guy. Yep. Oh, okay. Yeah. Along with like the R crumbs of the day. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that's, that's how, and he, that's how he knew him. about him. Mm. And so then Leo finances the, the doc, I guess. But um, in the case of this, like in what you just showed with the devil dinosaur thing, which uh, I think Rob said, like maybe became like a cartoon or something. Devil dinosaur, like yeah. it, it had like its own life, and he was like, uh, he's like, dude, he's always saying Kirby man. He's like, you know, devil dinosaur lasted far after you know he he created it, and I I, I don't know how because I'm I'm not aware of it. But that, uh, you know, illustration you just had shown was, I mean, that is spectacular. It, and it really is like you can see, uh, you know, you can see so much Starlin and, and again, that, and that thing mm-hmm. of like, you go like, do we need narration? Yeah. 
Just no, no, not yeah, really. Picture, do picture, I need uh, do I need a caption on the Mona Lisa? Right. Or on right. The, or on the scream? Right. Yeah. Or on like yeah. Also, on both of those, the captions are "Who farted?" That's. I was just thinking. I thought oh. the exact same thing. Yeah. And then on uh, American Gothic, it's "I'm with stupid." <laughs> yeah. Right. And then someone saying, right. "I farted." Pointed at the broad. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uh, okay. Now check this out. <laughs> okay. This one really cooked my noodle. Check you out one time yeah. like this here. In 78, he's hired by film producer Barry Geller to produce a concept art for a film uh, adaptation of the sci-fi fantasy novel The Lord of Light. Uh, Star Wars had convinced Geller that sci-fi epics could have big big paydays. So he puts together a team that include included Kirby, Dungeons & Dragons creator Gary Gygax, author Ray ba- Bradbury. Familiar with Ray Bradbury? Mm-hmm. I like um, his... Uh, Science fiction tales. Are you familiar <laughs> with his science fiction tales? <laughs> yes. Huh. The Illustrated Man, or yes, Fahrenheit yes. 451. Mm. Uh, and makeup artist John Chambers. So his, I his, like his Illustrated Man. Have you read it? No, no. Oh, it's a guy John with a Ch- bunch of tattoos. Oh, no, that one. I was Don't about, ask him about it. I was saying John tattoos. Chambers was, because he's a uh, makeup artist. His concept art was supposed to serve as the basis for the movie sets and as a first look at a theme park that Geller wanted to build in Colorado. <laughs> Neither the film or the park ever came oh into God. being. One of Geller's partners and some Colorado politicians went to prison on embezzlement charges when they got caught making shady land deals. Still, Chambers had some friends who wanted to make use of the project's materials, including Kirby's artwork. Chambers also did contract work for the CIA, makeup artist John Chambers, creating disguises for undercover operatives. Oh my God. When Lord of Light was falling apart in 79, Chambers' CIA friends reached out to him to help with another clusterfuck, the Iranian hostage crisis. Now, if you're familiar, in November, <laughs> talk about of '78, it. revolutionary Jesus students Christ. took 53 American hostages in Tehran. Six diplomats were able to escape, but had a hideout with British and Canadian ambassadors. So, with help from the Canadian State Department and CIA exfiltration expert Tony Mendes. <laughs> Uh, they reached out to Chambers for help devising a cover story to get the Americans. They helped. They had the diplomats pose as a Canadian film crew for the Lord of Light movie, which was renamed Argo mm. by the CIA. And his, the makeup he had to do, he had to give them all like uh, uh, Canadian faces. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Under, uh, they had yeah. to get those fucking Terrence and Philip mounts. Yeah, that's right. Canada issued them. Ah, yeah. can, can, <laughs> Canada issued them Canadian passports with fake names. <laughs> Gary, Gary. On January Gary. 27, 1970, the Americans were able to pass through security at Tehran's airport and boarded a flight to Zurich to escape Iran. Kirby's artwork was central to the plan. Really? It looked so legit that the Iranian government bought the explanation. The fact that the artwork had also followed strict Islamic religious laws helped too. The, the fuck out of here. The official story is that Kirby's art was provided to the CIA by Geller and Chambers without his knowledge, but nobody knows if he got involved with the CIA directly. But. Mm-hmm. Uh, his friend and biographer Ray Wyman says he saw a promotional Argo poster from 79 in Kirby's home. <laughs> the posters were released as part of the cover for a fake movie production. And Wyman also said that Kirby told him he had some admirers in the CIA. This wasn't publicly disclosed until 1977. And of course, this was made famous in the 2012 movie Argo. No shit. So all of his art that he had done for this mm. was used to get these fucking kids out of That's good art. Iran. And I bet... Uh, 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 those Persian fellas were really happy to be duped by a Jew. Oh. <laughs> I foiled the game by the great devil. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> like, That's fucking nice. I like that. <laughs> Man, I tell you, we just keep building up this sound. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> Kirby, you know, still not getting like super great treatment by 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 Marvel. Um, uh, no, you're talking about like late seventies. Yeah, 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 late seventies. And he created uh, these. Uh, he created everything. Yeah. Um, but what do you think? Well, copyright law changed in the 70s, so there were some things that, that it worked into his benefit, but he had such a fucking gigantic portfolio of work that there's no way that, that the debt could ever be repaid. Um, and then the just money wasn't just as good, so he went over to, um, he worked for Hanna-Barbera. 
did their Fantastic Four series, got a better pay, good relationship with animation colleagues, especially the younger artists there who grew up reading his yeah. shit. Damn. Um, did work on the new Fantastic Four animated series in 78. Stan Lee was also writing the scripts for the series. Uh, and apparently they had a pretty good relationship at that time. This was uh, one thing that made the Fantastic Four animated series at the time unique was that they didn't have the Human Torch because the Human Torch, uh, oh, the rights right. were tied up in it a pos- timely. No, no, they were actually tied up with a po- um, a TV pilot movie that Universal Studios wanted to develop. And like, there's also rumor like the I remember the, hearing about the this. the. the Oh, what would you say? The, uh, the, the apocryphal story is that uh, they didn't want kids setting themselves on fire. Right. But the, it was just that the rights were tied up. And so um, instead of the Human Torch, uh, Jack Herbie created Herbie, the robot. Yes. Uh, humanoid experimental robot, B-type, integrated electronics. Herbie the robot is in the poster for the new Fantastic Four movie. That's true. Uh, he also did a, a artwork for an adaptation of Disney's movie The Black Hole and a syndicated comic strip for Walt Disney's Treasury of Classic Tales. He made an uncredited cameo in the Incredible Hulk TV series with Lou Ferrigno. He was thrown through a window. He's in season two, episode No Escape, air date March 30th, 1979. In the hospital scene, you see Kirby playing a police sketch artist who's working off a of witness's <laughs> description. Drawing a picture of the man he says saved his life. Uh, instead of a police sketch artist making a drawing that resembles the live-action Hulk, he makes the Hulk as he appeared in the original comics. That's very, wow. very nice. Good touch. No Kirby Crackle, but drawing a cool original Hulk yeah. is pretty tight. And he's naked, right? Oh, yeah, except for just right around that. Since Big it... gamma balls. Oh, God. Wouldn't they shrink? Because of... I don't know. Because um, of the gamma? Yeah. <laughs> Good question. In the 80s, he and Roz make appear- are making appearances at comic conventions, um, making friends with new faces in the industries, in the industry. Um, I mean, the fucking guy is the industry. Yeah. Yeah. But still, like, just be- because of the way the copyright law was for the bulk of his career and his, as we talked about in part one, his kind of hey, if you do good work for the boss, the boss will take care of you no, kind of it, mindset. That's the thing we, I mean, we really have to come to here. Especially after f- doing work for free and stuff like that. Like, but, but and then going like, okay, so Marvel, DC, Marvel, like flipping around, you know, if you don't negotiate a better thing for yourself when you come back after being treated badly, like, I mean, it's like, you, you're like, come on, dude. It's, you know, it's, it's poor kid mindset too. I'll take the work. I'll take the work. I'll I know. Work. Like, his body of work is untouchable. Yeah. Completely. It's untouched. Like, just the sheer volume of it yeah. is un- nobody will ever come close. Yeah. Ever. Ever. I mean, the, the, ever. the amount of influence, and also, especially at this time, all these kids. It could have all been horseshit. Yeah. And it, it still would oh, be. Oh, that's the, true. Okay. I see what The you're record. Yeah. yeah. Never mind the fact that it's. Good. Banger, 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 yeah, banger. Yeah. You know, there's some fucking turds in there. I'm not reading fucking Teen Romance number 12. But you don't do teens. <laughs> I don't for do yourself, teens. <laughs> uh, let's I know see. a teen when I see one. Um, He does some He does some more shit. You know, at the <laughs> end of it. He Wait, how, how old is he uh, at this point? Gosh, the late uh, 70s? Uh, uh, yeah. God, no, I think what was he born? Uh, last time you checked no, in, I mean, you we're in the late seventies. Yeah, we're in the late seventies, early eighties. I now. think you said he was forty nine last time we checked in. Yeah, but that was that was about ten years earlier. So he's in his late fifties now. Um, in eighty seven. Okay. Uh, after you know some some petitioning and whatnot, um, the Comics Journal reported that Marvel was returning artwork to Jack Kirby mm-hmm. and other creators of his era who who you know were. Uh, maybe not treated so fairly. Mm-hmm. It had been estimated that he had produced over 10,000 pages for Marvel during his tenure. The company returned about 2,100 pieces. Uh, over the years, some of those missing pages would turn up for sale at a variety of locations from unknown origins. <laughs> unknown origins? Yeah. yeah. In 87, he was an inaugural inductee into the Will Eisner Comic Book Hall of Fame. Mm-hmm. I should say it real quick there. I mean, I think you and I both heard Liefeld talk about uh, the campaign to return Jack's art to him. 
Yeah. It was the thing where, like, those guys that were, uh, you know, in awe of him, that were like, oh, we're, we're uh, you know, on, on the shoulders of giants. Sure, yeah, yeah. And they were like, this guy did so much and, like, didn't really get paid and, like, return his original artwork to him so he can auction it off. Yeah, at the very least, he can make money off that that he didn't make yeah, when he did exactly, it originally. Exactly. Yeah, Let him have the yeah. artwork. Let, let yeah. him have... Like any other artist. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. And, and to Jim Shooter's credit, Jim Shooter, who started writing for Marvel at like 16. Yeah. Who would eventually become the editor-in-chief who pioneered Secret Wars. Yeah. Jim also, Sh- Leifold says is the best editor-in-chief. He, it, because he gave, he, he gave, he gave artists royalties. Yeah. He, he changed the game. Like, you don't get your fucking Todd McFarlane's yeah, and your yeah, Rob Liefeld yeah. multi, yeah. multi-millionaire artists. You do artists. have to make it worth their time. So You've got to give like, credit to, to, to Jim Shooter for doing like, that. It was like, if you create a character... That's your guy from now. You get royalties. From yeah. No matter as, what. As it should, I mean, as it should be. Yeah. yeah. And so, uh, you know, to his credit, Rob Liefeld, you know, offered to buy art from Jack, you know, yeah. at, at, at prices and stuff. And I think maybe he got a few things here and but, there, but uh, his pride, you know, kind of got in the way. Who's? Jack's. He didn't sell, like, everything, you know. Right. But, like, when, like, this was a thing, uh, those guys, creators at Marvel, were going to conventions wearing the t-shirt yeah, yeah that were like give jack his art back wow yeah um everybody really kind of fell in and were like you know the fuck we're, yeah like you're you're the guy uh you deserve to you know you know have some dignity here and 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 be rewarded uh let's see um early 90s uh bob newhart casts uh Jack Kirby uh, as himself in a uh, a show. <laughs> uh, um, this is Bob Newhart's third sitcom, Bob, for CBS. Yeah, he portrays okay. Bob McKay, the creator of a 1950s comic book superhero called Mad Dog. Jack Kirby plays himself in a season one episode. What? Uh, I didn't know Newhart had a 90s sitcom. Uh, he created a character called Mandroid. Mandroid. Um. Uh. uh and Similar to Machine Man. Yeah, but yeah. I'm a guy that I'm a machine man. <laughs> uh, I have impulses. <laughs> uh, Mandroid. Uh, let's like see. Uh, Mandroid is. Uh, uh, it's made into a film in 1993 to little fanfare. And on February 6, 1994, Jack Kirby, Jacob Kitzberg, passes away at home from heart failure. He was 76 years old. Smoking a cigar. He, he went out to smoke a cigar. <laughs> That's what my understanding is. He took, he took a walk outside to smoke a cigar. Buried in Westlake Village. Okay, no uh, Three years later, Rosalind dies, also passing away at home. In Westlake Village? Yeah. She went out to smoke a cigar. Uh, in September 2001, scientists announced the discovery of an asteroid they named Asteroid 51985 Kirby. Hopefully it's not Galactus. In 2019, they named a crater near Mercury's North Pole after Kirby. As of June 2018, movies based on characters that Kirby created or co-created created have collectively earned $7.4 billion. <laughs> I mean, you know, we've, we've made some money off this show, but... Um... Uh, in 2009, Neil, Susan, Barbara, and Lisa, his kids, all served termination notices to Disney, Fox, Universal, Paramount, and Sony in an attempt to regain control of several of their father's characters. Marvel worked to invalidate their claims. The kids sued Marvel in court to terminate copyrights and gain profits from creations. In 2001, a district court in New York issued a summary judgment that favored Marvel. In 2013, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit affirmed the ruling. The Kirby's filed a petition to the Supreme Court to review the case in 2014, but they reached a settlement with Marvel in 2014, and they dismissed their petition. They probably got a nice payday. Fucking hope there. so, man. And now I'm going to give you a reading of all the... Drop the bomb. ...characters that Jack Kirby, Jacob Kurtzfeld, uh-huh. is responsible for. In alphabetical order by... Size. Last name. By size. Ant-Man. Peggy Carter. The Abominable Snowman. <laughs> Absorbing Man. 
<laughs> Actor, Aginar, Aegon, Ajax, Annihilus, Ant-Man, Ares, Ereshem the Judge, all the Asgardians, Athena, Atlas, Atuma, the Avengers, Awesome Android, Baldur the Brave, Bucky Barnes, Bast, Batrock the Leaper, Beast, Becca, Bernadette, Big Barda, Black Bolt, Black Panther, Black Racer, Blastar, The Blob, Boar, Boy Commandos, Brotherhood of Mutants, Bucky, Captain 3D, Captain America, Sharon Carter, Celestials, Challengers of the Unknown, Izzy Cohen, Crazy Quilt, Crusaders, Crusher, Crystal, Cyclops, Sidorak, Dabari, da The Daily Bugle, Margot Damien, da The Danger Room, Randall Darby, Darkseid, Desaad. Uh, I think, sorry. I think five of those are bands. Uh, Desaad, Destroyer Duck, The Deviants, Devil Dinosaur, Devilance, Diablo, Dingbats of Danger Street, Dr. Bedlam, Dr. Doom, Doughboy, Dreaming Celestial, Dreadman the Druid, Dromedon, Dr. Druid, Druig, Dum Dum Dugan, Morgan Edge, Egghead, Ego the Living Planet, Enchantress 3, Enchantress, Enclave, East on the Searcher, The Eternals, Etric and the Demon, Executioner, Fandral, The Fantastic Four, Dr. Faustus, The Female Furies, Fenris Wolf, Biting American, Bing Fang Foom, Fixer, Funky Flashman, Fly, Forager, Forbushman, Forever People, Forgotten One, Jane Foster, Frightful Four, Nick Fury, Galactus, Gamemnon the Gatherer, Gargoyle, Giant Man, Giganto, Global Peace Agency, Glorious Godfrey, Goliath, Goom, Gorgon, Granny Goodness, Grey Gargoyle, Jean Grey, Ben Grimm, Groot, Growing Man, Guardian, Herbie, Hargan the Measurer, Agatha Harkness, Hatemonger, Heimdall, Hela, Hera, Hercules, Hermes, High Evolutionary, High Father, Hijacker, Hippolyta, Hogan, The Hulk, Human Cannibal, Human Torch, Iceman, Icarus, Immortus, Impossible Man, Infinity Man, The Inhumans, Intergang, Invisible Woman, Iron Man, It, The Living Colossus, Edwin Jarvis, Jemaya the Analyzer, Gabe Jones, Rick Jones, Eric... Good guy. <laughs> Eric Jostin, Juggernaut, Junior Juniper, Kazar, Kala, Commandy, Kang the Conqueror, Kantos, Carcass, Karnak, Kingo Sunin, Clarion the Witch Boy, Claw, Cobra, Krang, wow. Kree, Crow, Lashina, Lafay, Life Model Decoy, the concept. Mm -hmm. Lockjaw, Light Ray, Loki, Lucifer, Willie Lumpkin, Machine Man, The Mad Thinker, Magneto, Makari, Man Beast, Mangog, Manhunter, Jeez. Bruno Manheim, Mantis, Mastermind, Alicia Masters, Sky Master, Maximus, Medusa, Mentalo, Metron, Miracle Man, Mr. Miracle, Modoc, Mole Man, Molecule Man, Monstroso, Moon Boy, Morgan Le Fay, Mr. Scarlet, and Pinky the Wiz Kid, The New Gods, and News Boy, Legion, Mr. Miracle and the New Men list uh, as yet. Uh, oh, move on to the next letters. Oberon, Odin, Olympians, Omac, Oneg the Prober, Ugh. Orion, Painter, <laughs> Parademon, <laughs> Peepers, Pinky Pinkerton, Plunderer, Pink. Pluto, Power Broker, Prester John, Psycho Man, Puppet Master, Hank Pym, Maria Pym, Maria Pym Quasimodo, Quicksilver, Radioactive Man, Ransack the Reject, Rawhide Kid, Red Ghost, Red Skull, Reed Richard, Resistance, Franklin Richards, Ringmaster, Ronan the Accuser, Betsy Ross, Betty Ross, Thunderbolt Ross, Red Ryan, Sandman, Happy Sam Sawyer, Scarlet Witch, Sentinels, The Sentry, Cersei, Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, Lady Sif, Silver Surfer, Jasper Sitwell, Scrolls, Sleeper, Space Phantom, Sprite, Steppenwolf, Stompa, Franklin Storm, Stranger, Baron Strucker, Sunny Sumo, Super Adaptoid, The Supreme Intelligence, Surter, T'Chaka, Tana Nile, Tefral the Surveyor, Terrible Trio, Thena, Thor, Toad, Trapster, Bolivar Trask, Tricephalus, Triton, Tumblr, Dan Turpin, Two Gun Kid, Tyr, Uatu, The Watcher, Ulik, Unicorn, Unis the Untouchable, Falcon, Vanisher, Vermin, Vunduba, Vision from Timely Comics, Volstag, Adam Warlock, Warriors 3, Wasp, Watcher, Whirlwind, Wyatt Wingfoot, Wizard, Wonder Man, Wong Chu, Warren Worthington III, a.k.a. Archangel, Wrecker, X-Men, Professor X, Zemu, The Yancey Street Gang, Emir, Young Allies, Zabu, Zarin, Zarko, Baron Zemo, Heinrich Zemo, Helmut Zemo, Zeus, Zirin the Tester, Arnim, Zola, and Zurus. God damn. Find someone else. He took all the King of Comics. Fucking insane, dude. If you've only watched the movies, you recognize a chord of those names. Yeah. Yeah. Just from the movies. Yeah. Yeah. If you read comics, you recognize three quarters. Yeah. Oh, that guy. Yeah. 
put a bunch to. And they're not putting Peter Parker in there. No, no, no. But I mean, that's the kind of thing too, where you go like, all right, so if he does, you know, Spider Man, um, or with Warlock, I think it's 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 like, um, you know, I bought the Starling Collection of Warlock. Like I was telling you, when he, when he makes fun of the Marvel editorial staff. It makes more sense when you find out, like, oh, he took this character from a guy that already had beefs with the editorial. with the Marvel editorial staff, and so like the Starlin era of of Warlock is from like issue seven and on, yeah. which means the original uh, six were, you know, Kirby or what, or you know, whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, uh, everybody was. Just like, like he built the sandbox. Yeah, know. yeah, and the stories that came. I mean, I most of those characters are people that I read in the nineties. Yeah. That yeah. other other artists and it, that had brought back random guys who maybe had one appearance, and then they came back and they were caps, uh, a villain for like four issues. Yeah, and so the, he just created such a world. Yeah, so many, so many characters. Yeah. But like those those people coming in like Starlin, where they just go like, "Oh, fucking warlock!" Like you set the stage with warlock, where like now I'm just gonna you know completely go off with it, and now warlock is we consider a, a Jim Starlin thing because yeah. he he just took off with it. Yeah. But it's one of those things where you go like, it took somebody dallying with it for a minute, in the same way like we we talk about uh you know like it was the thing my dad said about um. The birds. He's like, the birds heard the Beatles do a little bit of jangly stuff, and they're yeah. like, that's all we're going to do now. Yeah, jangle it right. up. Right. We're just going to zone in on that one mm -hmm. Beatles sound that they're just flirting with for a minute before they move on to other awesome shit. Very interesting, yeah. awesome things. Yeah. But we just love that. Yeah. So we're staying with that song. Yeah. And we're going to keep doing yeah, that. Yeah, that's like the burden of genius is like, oh, I don't have time. Like, here, take my table scraps and make a fucking four course gourmet yeah. meal out of it. Yeah. Because I just, I got other shit. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean working on. the the Hulk, the Immortal Hulk that uh, we've Probably read doing, yeah. uh, takes it to such a level. But, but, you know, he didn't have time. Kirby didn't necessarily have time. He was working on so many things. He didn't have time necessarily to really yeah, and who knows flesh if he out that idea. He ever would have got there. Yeah. But still. But like, he set the table with such an interesting character. Yeah, especially also basing it off of ideas he had from other right. interesting characters in, in in literary history, and he just gave it such a interesting uh, um, ethos and 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 idea that yeah. someone goes, "What if Bro specific enough to dial in and explore, but broad yeah. enough to have room to play?" Yeah, to really make it, you know, so the next writer can make it their own, right? In a way, it's very much like uh, uh, with Pretty Things. Oh, Poor Things. Poor Things, that's it. Thank yes, you. yes. Well, um, fuck her a lot. Yeah, 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 exactly. But but a mod a different version of, of Frankenstein. Right, yeah. Frankenstein's fuck hole. <laughs> I, I think the thing uh, <laughs> we got with uh, the Immortal Hulk thing was a kind of... Uh, Basically, like a, a a final like grounding, yeah, of like what because like I was saying from the beginning of of, of uh, the creation of the character, it's like uh, this is kind of out of hand, and we don't know how it's gonna go. And you're like, and then it goes through different writers, and you go like, yeah. oh, now we're gonna do this split personality thing, and we're gonna go through all this different stuff, and you, you kind of go like, all right, well, we know he's crazy powerful, but what is the center of this character. Right. And we kind of crave that. Yeah. And and that is also what makes the Garth and his Punisher with Bourne Very be similar. like, okay, here's a final judgment. Yeah. On what mm -hmm. the character is here for and what mm -hmm. they're here to and do. And what's the fire inside driving yeah. whatever it is they have going for them. And so I I, I like I was interested like in this, when you said that uh, Galactus came in so much later into Fantastic Four, which I I, I didn't mm, only five years. 
Only Wait, five I years. I mean, Kang came, like, right. I mean, Kang was number one. Or Kang was uh, issue three or something. Fantastic Four. Kang, Kang was uh, Avengers 8, I believe. Oh, he was an Avengers villain as, as Rama Tut before? Oh, that's true. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. Number one was, like, the mole people or whatever, Fantastic Four. Yeah, yeah. And then there was Rama Tut with the Fantastic Four that they then read, right. they retconned to be Kang. They did, yes. But Kang was a very early villain, before, much but way before Galactus, yeah. But I guess, you know, in that time, I look at uh, the earliest... Uh, which is their top selling title, which is Spider Man. And you go like immediately it's like Vulture, Vulture Doc, Doc Ock, like bam, 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 bam. His Rogues Gallery is only rivaled by Batman's. Yeah. Uh like and, and, Liefeld says it's it's the better Rogues Gallery. And I and it, and it happened in like eight issues. They all just went bang, 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 bang. And they served as perfect foils, you know. So so many of these characters were uh Reflective of of whatever fears we had at the time, right? Like, sure, yeah, yeah. Uh, the bomb, mm-hmm. and then ra- and radiation, Spider Man, and and Hulk were were, were that, and then, uh, and the Fantastic Four with space, mm-hmm. like they all had the whatever the paranoia was of the day, and then you know, well, Spider Man Two is just like a thing where you go like it's you know it's a. Uh... If it's the fucking scorpion or whatever, you go like it's it, it's it's a basic criminal, but he's he, he's souped up. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. He's still gonna rob a bank or whatever, but it, it's it's going to uh, general New York crime paranoia. Yeah. Which is you know, ever gonna be on the upswing way more than people know in the sixties. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, like it's uh it's still a very valid fear to deal with. But yeah, and and a lot of. And, and Spider Man's Rose Gallery was very much like, also sympathizing with their poverty and and yeah stuff like that. Yeah, it was it it was very 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 fair. But I um, if you're saying what uh, for Galactus like sixty, that means yeah five years. You know, it's it, it it's a while. Yeah, and I I guess just because of how iconic Spider Man's villains were so early, I assumed it was the same with. The Fantastic Four. No, there's a lot of Mole Man shit and a lot of like, you know, yeah. rock people and, you know. And the writing was not that great, but, but it, it was a family and they had a dynamic and, you know, Reed right. was distant and Ben was pissed. Yeah. And Johnny wants to be famous, like, is, you yeah. know, he's a teenager. And, and, and Kirby himself, he probably had what, three or four kids maybe at that yeah, point. And so, you know, Reed's the father of everything. Yeah. And so there's this. He named, this is one, the, one of his daughters' name is Susan. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 you know, because you're talking about Spider Man villains, and I was thinking about Fantastic Four. Their first villains are, are generally Earth folks, they get their powers from space. Their, their villains are Earth folks, right? In so the there's a contrast yeah. there. Spider Man, his villains are electricity. Someone with more arms. Yeah. You know, another, an- another animal. Guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and so the, the, how do you think of the contrast? How do you beat this hero, someone who's different in a way that they can't handle? And so may, uh, maybe there's some back and forth contrast of why it's Earth so much with Fantastic Four. And then he goes, the ultimate guy from space. Yeah. Galactus. Yeah. There, I mean, there's also and the, the idea of having a herald and, and yes, making, the herald is really ha, make, having the herald be guilt, like what a incru- maybe like his most the character that is the most like certainly filled with pathos, but like one of the most over like right off the jump able to be um, analyzed and 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 has some introspection because the Silver Surfer. Basically, what his origin, correct me if I'm wrong, is that Galactus comes to his planet to consume it because Galactus is he is also a tragic character. Galactus yeah. doesn't he is he's a survivor from the previous universe, and as as the new universe is born, he is consumed by a hunger for uh, life or living planets. And to make this task easier, he ha- he anoints a herald who gives him the power. Co- he gives them the power cosmic, and they're out. And they go find worlds for him to consume to satisfy this right. hunger, which he does not want. But he's so above and beyond it. Like I don't really care who's there. Yeah. But it's just a fact of life. Then the same way you and I fucking eat chicken nuggets. <laughs> yes. I'm... I don't care where the nuggets came from <laughs> until you go to the nugget farm. Yeah. Where yeah. they grow nuggets. Yeah. And. 
<laughs> and the Silver Surfer, basically, when, when Galactus comes to his planet, he makes a deal and he says, spare my home world. I'll be your And friend. I will find you other planets. Yeah. yeah. And he leaves his and world also, and can family. Which is yeah. Zen La? No. Um, his name is Norrin Rad. Mm-hmm. But I think yeah, the, his plan. I don't remember what his home surfer, planet. Or it might be the woman he loves. Is yeah, some gentle, something. Some like, but uh, Silver Surfer is the first comic I ever, I ever bought. I mean, it was it's so cool for kids. Yeah. I mean, like imagine being in the '60s when surfing was the fucking you know, beach blanket. Sure, and yeah, bingo yeah. and you know Batman surfing. <laughs> you know, yeah, on TV. Right, Never yeah. mind the '90s yeah. when he's fucking. He looks like t- he looks like the T1000 on a surfboard. You're right. Right. Yeah. yeah. So he makes this deal. It's incredibly fucking cool. Dude, and then when like mm-hmm. artists like Alex Ross or Moebius do it, it's fucking like just on, it's on another the, level. The, the, yeah, the Moebius uh, things. You ever when it, uh, when they're doing comic book men? <sighs> no. The Kevin Smith thing? Oh yeah. And they would just like auction like full page like splashes of Moebius just having yeah. Silver Surfer like in the cosmos and like they were like this is a million dollar. Kind of like It's artwork. Yeah. I it's mean, it's high art. So that character being like, I made the trade off to be like, I sacrificed countless other worlds to save my own. And he fucking, he lives with that guilt. Yeah. Yeah. Every day for infinity. Yeah. And like, even into, um, cosmic ghost Rider, he's there at the end. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah. Cos- a cosmic ghost Rider fucking the silver surfer is there at the end of the universe with thor's hammer saying that i've been gone for so long becoming worthy yeah and fucking he comes crazy, back and he fucking dude. wallops thanos with fucking his board and the and and mjolnir it's yeah fucking incredible like he comes out of nowhere as the guy who finally absolved himself of right yeah this is the, the final ca- countless, absolution yeah countless genocides yeah. over till the end of time to, to save his family he had to kill other families and and did that like incredible that you know I just got the, like those first Starlin Warlock books and uh, you see things that, like he he crosses with Thanos and stuff mm-hmm. like that and like I mean there's just like amazingly psychedelic crazy imagery there that is it, it's so dense where like I really want to just sit down with Jim Starlin and be like what were you saying here right because it's heavy yeah. Uh, like I'm, I'm like, I, I really want to know, like, yeah, it takes well, a lot more digestion than a Kirby panel. Yeah, because like, he's got like floating heads and like there's just there's somebody laughing and in like the gaping maw of laughter you see like the tiny skull of death and, yeah. and, and like, mm, just, yeah. like all whatever well, Dali sort of yeah, yeah all that sort of stuff. But then in you know the prelude. To 1991's Infinity Gauntlet, Starlin is doing Silver Surfer. Yeah. So he's just like kind of like fulfilling this promise that he started so long ago with Warlock and Thanos Mm -hmm. and just how it's like. And Silver Surfer is the one who's sent back as basically the herald for Thanos. Yeah, yeah. They made uh, unwi- unwitting. They made know, it. Uh, they Hulk, made, they Hulk made it Hulk in, in Infinity War. Yeah, but they just fucking cast you know the Silver Surfer and he crash lands and you know, he's like Thanos is coming. Yeah. Uh, be- before before we uh, go, Aaron. Um, other than the Argo thing, what what is something about this that uh, that surprised you and kind of made you more excited than you thought you'd be about doing this profile? Because because you were very excited. The Argo thing blew my mind. Yeah. I did not know that no, I mean, until yeah, that's, today. That's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I, I it love... It is fucking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, the 75 pages a month. Yeah. 10 covers a month. Yeah. Just the sheer, like... It's like, com- this guy has forgot more comics than you and I have <laughs> yeah. ever considered to exist. Right. That's the thing. Yeah. I think is just the the industry, the comic book industry, and the movie industry don't exist in the form they do today without this guy's creation. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. I think that's an undeniable fact. Yeah. End of story. Like. Yeah. 
yes, movies that had existed and in, in the industry, you know, people, okay, yeah, there's westerns and there's sci-fi and the action, but for the past 20 fucking years, it's been comic book movies, mm-hmm. for better or worse. Mm-hmm. And 80% of those came from the mind of Jack Kirby. In one way or another. Yeah, it is, it, it, is, it is crazy to think about. And now fucking X-Men's back on fire. Mm-hmm. And that animated series, that started the fucking boom in 2000, man. It's... I, I remember being in the back of the bus in third grade reading, like, Wizard Comics, doing the fan cast for a comic book for an X-Men movie... And it was like, all right, Patrick Stewart's Professor X, Kelsey uh-huh. Grammer's Beast. I think they, <laughs> I think they had like, um, guy who was Bowie's wife, uh, Grace Jones's yeah. Storm and shit yeah, like yeah. that, you know. <laughs> and it was, of course, a Cyclops, a Cyclops. Yeah, they had, they had an actual Cyclops. And you know, for a long time, Wesley Snipes wanted to do a Black Panther movie, but they, you know, they didn't want to do that, so he he pushed. was pushing hard for that for it, a while, a long time. And you know what? It's better that he did Blade. Blade is pretty messy. And he's a, so, he's a choreographer on, on Blade. Really? Yeah, he's a great choreographer. And so I think I've, it was probably Liefeld again, with amazing comics journalism, I think, that I learned it from. But it was like, not only after he had done Blade 1 and 2, he was still kind of going like, I still want to do a Black Panther movie. Yeah. Yeah. And then they were like, all right, well, maybe, and blah, blah, blah. And then like it just became like, Will you do Blade Three? Like you know, and right, like, right. You know, whatever. But with Ryan Reynolds, yeah. yeah. But um, and they busted him on tax evasion. They basically like they, they dredged this up when Black Pan- Panther was coming out, and it was uh maybe even after it was like a hit and nominated for Oscars and stuff. But they hit him up, and they were like, "Do you feel like kind of butt hurt that like?" This thing you were trying to get going forever in the '90s is now like a thing, a and, and 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 very lauded. And he's like, "No," uh, he's like, "I'm just happy it happened." That's cool. Yeah, correct that's response. He probably grew up reading it. Yeah, and like, it's tough to have a better Black Panther than what we got. Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. pretty good. And uh, it sucks how it ended up, but. Kirby, again. Yeah. Crazy. Weird Afro- Afrofuturism stuff. Like, just the mind on the guy. Yeah. yeah. yeah just yeah. this dude yeah. from fucking New York yeah. who... But that thing, too, of, like, like we're saying, like, you don't have to change the design one iota from the 60s to the present. You can just leave it as it is. That being, like, so specific and iconic for whatever he's doing... You listed all the characters. There's no confusion, like, oh, that guy looks like that guy. There's none of that. No, shit. they're all they're all so singular, u- unique yeah, and right, specific. Right. That kind of like attention to detail and and specificity is why that Argo shit worked. Sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's why they go like, oh, well, oh, no, clearly no, yeah, clearly no, this isn't bullshit. He's Nobody could make this. He's up. following the rules. Of Islam yeah. in the drawings. Dude, that's they're, they're, they're like nuts They're like, too, who, who drew this? Can we get this guy over here to draw for us, for the Shah? Was it a guy named Muhammad? It looks like it was a guy <laughs> named Muhammad. I'm actually a Jewish you guy. Fucking you fucking motherfuckers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's just, that there's you, nobody can hold a candle to the guy. No, I mean, uh, not remotely. No. You know, uh, there's, there's. If it was just the X Men, if it was just the Fantastic Four, right, right. just Spider Man, right? Still, yeah. The Avengers, yeah. Done. Pretty incredible. Goodbye. <laughs> Never mind. The Avengers was made up. Yeah. Of Iron Man, him, Hulk, him, Thor, him. Mm-hmm. Dude. Wasp. Hi. White people. <laughs> Magne- like, dude, he's got the two best villains of all time, Magneto and Doctor Doom. Mm-hmm. Both, like, tragic figures who have been discriminated against for who they are. Like, dude, what are you yeah. going to do? 
What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? Go to your local comic book shop on a Wednesday and buy a new comic. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, uh, 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 comic shop near me at work. Uh huh. They have those old timing comics, and I, I, I'm so, I'm so tempted to see this uh, early iterations of uh, you know the Defenders with uh, yeah, Kim and Torch and Nemo. Namur, Namur. Namur. You know, oh, I think he did some Defender stuff too. Yeah, I, and I, Champions. I, I didn't even mention Champions and the Defenders. Yeah, another more teams. Dude, it's 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 fucking endless, man. Uh, it, it, it's it's really fucking cool. Um, you know, I love uh, Rob Liefeld, and I I I think Rob Liefeld's podcast in comics journalism is immaculate. I I, yeah. I think he's you know, not he he's absolutely a shameless self promoter, but I, I think that's fine because he's he's doing it to let you know that he's got cred, and and he'll let you know what his opinion is versus settled fact. Mm-hmm. But he does have an encyclopedic knowledge and a real real passion for comics, and it's infectious. And it's I look forward to it every week for better or worse. It's incredible, and and the thing is is like, you know, I I I put my eyebrow for firmly raised when it comes to comics history that he's a character in Mm -hmm. and even when it's people that are like he's talking about people that that have clearly been his enemies uh he handles it with a way where he kind of laughs it off um but he handles those kinds of like controversies of like what was cool what was popular the same way he does when it's older comics history yeah. and it's more like a Kirby time and he goes like the sales don't lie. The fans don't lie. Here's what they were buying. Yeah. Here's the receipts on, yeah. you know, yeah. what was selling then and what was selling in the 90s. And they'll tell you what's influence or rip off of another thing and they'll be like, yeah, I did Cable because the Terminator was huge. Yeah. yeah. The glowing eye. The fucking metal arm. Yeah. Yeah. Terminator. Yes. Shamelessly. Like he'll tell you. It's it's very sweet. Yeah, and you know he's not above being criticized in his own works. Like in the Deadpool movies, they make fun of like who created you? Probably a guy who can't draw feet. <laughs> yeah, Victoria, he couldn't yeah, draw yeah, feet. Yeah, yeah. He he parodied his his own very famous horrible Captain America drawing. Yeah, where Captain America's got this giant like awkwardly positioned. It's fucking out of control. And then like last year. He did a Sam Wilson Captain America variant mm-hmm. with the same dimension. Nice. It's all yeah. fucked up. And yeah. Like, okay, says humor. I'll take it. Yeah. yeah, but he did really make me understand how, um, especially with that podcast, how big a deal Kirby is. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I, I I didn't understand how they all learned uh, physical like fight drawing from him. Yeah, and uh, you know how how he just uh, you know. Showed them how to draw bodies, basically. Yeah, yeah as a as a and kid face, I, and faces, dude. As a yeah. kid, I had a uh, or my brothers did, but I uh, stole it from them. It was a um, how to draw Marvel characters, and that's how I learned to draw. Yeah, was you know stick figure, yeah. shape out the muscles, uh, drawing comics the Marvel way. That's the, yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. And that is uh, was it? No, was it Ditko or Romita? I think it, it, it might have. It was one of the Ramitas, and he gives credit, and uh, there's there's Kirby credit in there, I believe. I'm sure there must be. Um, yeah, no, because the everything I drew reminded me of reading old, yeah, old comics. From, yeah, because my my mom's brothers were were uh, comic uh, readers in the '60s. Yeah, and so yeah, we have uh, Avengers. One of the the Avengers where Kang first shows up, I think. Oh shit! Yeah, fucking amazing. Somewhere yeah. it's in an attic. Somewhere. It's in, yeah, I believe that splooge. is. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sports uh, Illustrated swimsuit or jacking off to this. Kang and Kang. I believe that is Avengers number eight. Yeah, I think it is because yeah. there's all these the little circles and Kangs in there. Ah, I got you. And it's, it's pretty, it's pretty great. So also before that, I think you said it's it's probably uh, Ramatut and Fantastic Four. Yeah. And e- even also before Kang, it's still also Mole Man. No, uh, uh, the other oh, Kang man. iteration. Oh, Immortus? Immortus shows up also before Kang. No. I believe. Yeah, maybe you're right. And then they were all retconned. And they all the were retconned to be the same fucking asshole. Which is brilliant. 
It's it so is good. a good it is a good idea too, especially. It's made, and that that, that makes true. a whole other character exactly. that we could talk yeah, about yeah. as far as complexity, as yeah. far as like the young man, the middle aged mm-hmm. man, the old man, yeah. like, right? All like the 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 internal strife that you have with the different ages and eras of yourself is another character we could talk about forever. Okay, but so, I mean, I I know uh, you, we're all uh, comic book aficionados, enthusiasts, uh, and then you've seen in, in the course of a. Uh, uh, Looking over this um, amassed data from Laura Crawford about Jack Kirby. I mean, do you think at the end of the day you go like, why the fuck didn't this guy get paid more? Do you think like he should have oh, did he get paid more? I mean, do you think like what the fuck is going on? Why isn't this guy really? Do you think he got part, paid I think in part, the part end? of? I think his family did. Yeah, I think his family did at the end. Yeah. I don't think he did not. No, no, but his family did. Yeah. Um. And there's a few there's a few documentaries you can watch, and you know, you know that's the, the that's the the sad refrain of history is that you're not appreciate you know they'll appreciate they'll love me when I'm dead. Yeah. yeah. Um. And when Stan was going, it was like he was Kevin, getting fucked over Kevin's, three ways yeah, yeah. Tuesday. Like, yeah. What the fuck was going on there? Yeah, his own fucking guy was fucking like. Yeah. It's it's horrible, um, and it's you know it's a sad day when you know the Disney Corporation is the voice of reason with that. <laughs> like, yeah, it, it was his own handler embezzling money and like, yeah. I, I, but Stan was always doing. Stan always did. I think Stan always did well mm-hmm. because he, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. Yeah, and Jack was just I'm I, I'm work. I like to work. Yeah, and I'll I'll you know. Go but that for it, that it continues to the point where, you know, uh, the architect of of a lot of Endgame, uh, Jim Starlin goes, "I will never work with Marvel Comics again." Marvel Cinematic Universe has been very kind to me. I have no problem with them whatsoever. I'll show up in Endgame. He's like, "But I yeah. will never do Marvel Comics again." Yeah, it just shows that you're like. You guys are still fucking up, like relationships with well, creators. It's a, it's a. It's they longer. stopped. They were. They stopped producing entire fucking runs of comics so that the movies would fail. I think it was Fantastic Four, and X Men, yeah. and it, like yeah. they just stopped producing them because Fox owned it. Yeah, and they're like, well, we're not gonna give them free advertising, so we'll just stop making these comics. Yeah, yeah. No. The fuck is that about? It's it, it's it's this next 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 generation of these guys in charge of shit that don't give a shit about it. It's not about the artistic creation. It's about the bottom line. Can we make the slightly bigger profit the next quarter? Right. These people don't do not care. Hopefully, you know you've got, but we do have a generation of people like ourselves who are now in our fucking forties who Speaking grew up on suck my dick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not there yet, but John is. Yeah. Uh, Big time, Daddy. And you know, these are the guys now that are making the X Men '97. Right. They're the people. Like they're now in positions to be like, you know what? This was super important to me growing up, and I'm not gonna fuck it up. Right. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. And so Please. far, that is fucking knocking it out of the park. What a sweet love letter. Yeah. Apparently they're doing the same thing with the Batman animated series. Uh, really? They're doing like Bruce Timm style. Cool. Uh, Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Like in the you know it, in the same way that it's a love letter to the prior um, prior series. It's crazy how gripping it is oh, for adults to watch. It's le- legitimately. I get the sh- best like, thing Marvel's done in years. It just is. And it's something they did 25 years ago. I know, but I mean, like, their take on it this time is staying with it, and it's... Go home and watch it tonight. Like, yeah. the, new one, the new one's fire. X-Men 97 on Disney+. Plus. Catch it. Catch it. <laughs> uh, Aaron, this is great. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Matt, did you... Absolutely. Okay, good. Well, let's all give high praise to Laura Crawford. Yes. Laura, we as love always. You. That was exactly. so great. Fantastic Research. job, Laura. Isn't that nice? And let's all give thanks to Jack Kirby. Yeah. Let's give thanks to Jack Kirby for and- being the architect of modern pop culture. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 I mean- They're not selling fucking, <laughs> you know, 
Cuisat's Hatterack socks. They're not selling sandworm shoes. That's true. But there's they, no the fucking con. There's no converse with Muadib. I mean, sandworm socks would make a. a the only pretty, sandworm it, socks are fucking Beetlejuice socks. The sandworm you know talking about my foot. Bish, bish, bish. Hey, listen, man. I love Frank Herbert. Dune's great. Yeah. But it's not fucking X Men. Listen. We shall see. Yeah. There's not fucking melted Captain America face. Uh, uh, <laughs> versions of ice cream with fucking Timothy Shower. Right <laughs> Deadpool and Wolverine. See it in cinemas. Yeah. Fuck it. Paul Atreides is not listed on Esquire's list of most favored revolutionary figures. That's true. Next to Che Guevara. To He's true. the most revolutionary figure in the known universe. He doesn't you want know, it. He doesn't no, want it. No, it's not supposed to be that way. But, oh, and Hulk is? Hulk is inexplicable. Spiderman? Is very explicable. I get listen, I get it, but I'm just telling you, that's why. Dude. I'm preaching the choir here. I hope. I preach- yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a grand time. I loved Fantastic. I loved learning. You could about- say it was fantastic. Fantastic. Uh-huh. Or even uncanny or amazing mm. or spectacular. Mm. Incredible. Amazing. Uh, mm. <laughs> Tales to astonish. Mm. Aaron, I love you, buddy. Thank love you too. for that. I'm going to say goodnight. My name is John Fahey. I'm Aaron Pita. My Good night, everybody. We love you. Excelsior! Oh, show. Sure.